Shiva, the Mahadev, the God of Gods, destroyer of evil, passionate lover, fierce warrior, consummate dancer, charismatic leader, all powerful yet incorruptible, quick wit accompanied by an equally quick and fearsome temper. Over the centuries, no foreigner who came to our land, conqueror, merchant, scholar, ruler, traveler, believed that such a great man could possibly exist in reality. They assumed that he must have been a mythical god whose existence could be possible only in the realms of human imagination. Unfortunately, we Indians adopted this view as well. But what if we are wrong? What if Lord Shiva was not a figment of a rich imagination, but a person of flesh and blood, like you and me, a man who rose to become godlike because of his karma? That is the premise of the Shiva trilogy, which interprets the rich mythological heritage of ancient India, blending fiction with historical fact. This work is therefore a tribute to Lord Shiva and the lesson that his life teaches us. A lesson lost in the depths of time and ignorance. A lesson that all of us can rise to be better people. A lesson that there exists a potential God in every single human being. All we have to do is listen to ourselves. The Immortals of Meluha is the first book in the trilogy that chronicles the journey of this extraordinary hero. Two more books are to follow, The Secret of the Nagas and The Oath of the Vayuputras. Chapter 1 He Has Come 1900 BC, Mansarovar Lake, at the foot of Mount Kailash, Tibet. Shiva gazed at the orange sky. The clouds hovering above Mansarovar had just parted to reveal the setting sun. The brilliant giver of life was calling it a day once again. Shiva had seen a few sunrises in his 21 years, but the sunset, he tried never to miss the sunset. On any other day, Shiva would have taken in the vista, the sun and the immense lake against the magnificent backdrop of the Himalayas stretching as far back as the eye could see, but not today. He squatted and perched his lithe muscular body on the narrow ledge extending over the lake. The numerous battle scars on his skin gleamed in the shimmering reflected light of the waters. Shiva remembered well his carefree childhood days. He had perfected the art of throwing pebbles that bounced off the surface of the lake. He still held the record in his tribe for the highest number of bounces, 17. On a normal day, Shiva would have smiled at the memory from a cheerful past that had been overwhelmed by the angst of the present. But today, he turned back towards his village without any hint of joy. Bhadra was alert, guarding the main entrance. Shiva gestured with his eyes. Bhadra turned back to find his two backup soldiers dozing against the fence. He cursed and kicked them hard. Shiva turned back towards the lake. God bless Bhadra. At least he takes some responsibility. Shiva brought the chillam made of yak bone to his lips and took in a deep drag. Any other day, the marijuana would have spread its munificence, dulling his troubled mind and letting him find some moments of solace. But not today. He looked left, at the edge of the lake where the soldiers of the strange foreign visitor were kept under guard. With the lake behind them and twenty of Shiva's own soldiers guarding them, it was impossible for them to mount any surprise attack. They let themselves be disarmed so easily. They aren't like the bloodthirsty idiots in our land who are looking for any excuse to fight. The foreigner's words came flooding back to Shiva. Come to our land. It lies beyond the great mountains. Others call it Meluha. I call it heaven. It is the richest and most powerful empire in India. Indeed, the richest and most powerful in the whole world. Our government has an offer for immigrants. You will be given fertile land and resources for farming. Today, your tribe, the Gunas, fight for survival in this rough, arid land. Meluha offers you a lifestyle beyond your wildest dreams. We ask for nothing in return. Just live in peace, pay your taxes, and follow the laws of the land. Shiva mused that he would certainly not be a chief in this new land. Would I really miss that so much? His tribe would have to live by the laws of the foreigners. They would have to work every day for a living. That's better than fighting every day just to stay alive. Shiva took another puff from his chillum. As the smoke cleared, 
he turned to stare at the hut in the center of his village, right next to his own, where the foreigner had been stationed. He had been told that he could sleep there in comfort. In fact, Shiva wanted to keep him hostage, just in case. We fight almost every month with the Pakritis, just so that our village can exist next to the holy lake. They are getting stronger every year, forming new alliances with new tribes. We can beat the Pakritis, but not all the mountain tribes together. By moving to Meluha, we can escape this pointless violence and maybe live a life of comfort. What could possibly be wrong with that? Why shouldn't we take this deal? It sounds so damn good. Shiva took one last drag from the chillum before banging it on the rock, letting the ash slip out, and rose quickly from his perch. Brushing a few specks of ash from his bare chest, he wiped his hand on his tiger skin skirt, rapidly striding to his village. Bhadra and his backup stood to attention as Shiva passed the gate. Shiva frowned and gestured for Bhadra to ease up. Why does he keep forgetting that he's been my closest friend since childhood? My becoming the chief hasn't really changed anything. He doesn't need to behave unnecessarily servile in front of others. The huts in Shiva's village were luxurious compared to others in their land. A grown man could actually stand upright in them. The shelter could withstand the harsh mountain winds for nearly three years before surrendering to the elements. He flung the empty chillum into his hut as he strode to the hut where the visitor lay sleeping soundly. Either he doesn't realize he's a hostage, or he genuinely believes that good behavior begets good behavior. Shiva remembered what his uncle, also his guru, used to say. People do what their society rewards them to do. If the society rewards trust, people will be trusting. Meluha must be a trusting society if it teaches even its soldiers to expect the best in strangers. Shiva scratched his shaggy beard as he stared hard at the visitor. He had said his name was Nandi. The Meluhan's massive proportions appeared even more enormous as he sprawled on the floor in his stupor, his immense belly jiggling with every breath. Despite being obese, his skin was taut and toned. His childlike face looked even more innocent asleep with his mouth half open. Is this the man who will lead me to my destiny? Do I really have the destiny my uncle spoke of? Your destiny is much larger than these massive mountains. But to make it come true, you will have to cross these very same massive mountains. Do I deserve a good destiny? My people come first. Will they be happy in Meluha? Shiva continued to stare at the sleeping Nandi. Then he heard the sound of a conch shell. Pakrathis! Positions! screamed Shiva as he drew his sword. Nandi was up in an instant, drawing a hidden sword from his fur coat kept to the side. They sprinted to the village gates. Following standard protocol, the women started rushing to the village center, carrying their children along. The men ran the other way, swords drawn. Badra, our soldiers at the lake! shouted Shiva as he reached the entrance. Badra relayed the orders, and the Guna soldiers obeyed instantly. They were surprised to see the Meluhans draw weapons hidden in their coats and rush to the village. The Pakritis were upon them within moments. It was a well-planned ambush by the Pakritis. Dusk was usually a time when the Guna soldiers took time to thank their gods for a day without battle. The women did their chores by the lakeside. If there was a time of weakness for the formidable Gunas, a time when they weren't a fearsome martial clan, but just another mountain tribe trying to survive in a tough, hostile land, this was it. But fate was against the Pakritis yet again. Thanks to the foreign presence, Shiva had ordered the Gunas to remain alert. Thus, they were forewarned and the Pakritis lost the element of surprise. The presence of the Meluhans was also decisive, turning the tide of the short, brutal battle in favor of the Gunas. The Pakritis had to retreat. Bloodied and scarred, Shiva surveyed the damage at the end of the battle. Two Guna soldiers had succumbed to their injuries. They would be honored as clan heroes. But even worse, the warning had come too late for at least ten Guna women and children. Their mutilated bodies were found next to the lake. The losses were high. Bastards! They kill women and children when they can't beat us! A livid Shiva called the entire tribe to the center of the village. His mind was made. This land is fit for barbarians. We have fought pointless battles with no end in sight. You know my uncle tried to make peace, even offering access to the lake shore to the mountain tribes. But these scum mistook our desire for peace as weakness. We all know what followed. 
The Gunas, despite being used to the brutality of regular battle, were shell-shocked by the viciousness of the attack on the women and children. I keep nothing secret from you. All of you know the invitation of the foreigners, continued Shiva, pointing to Nandi and the Meluhans. They fought shoulder to shoulder with us today. They have earned my trust. I want to go with them to Meluha. But this cannot be my decision alone. You are our chief, Shiva, said Bhadra. Your decision is our decision. That is the tradition. Not this time, said Shiva, holding out his hand. This will change our lives completely. I believe the change will be for the better. Anything will be better than the pointlessness of the violence we face daily. I have told you what I want to do. But the choice to go or not is yours. Let the Gunas speak. This time, I follow you. The Gunas were clear on their tradition. But the respect for Shiva was not just based on convention, but also on his character. He had led the Gunas to their greatest military victories through his genius and sheer personal bravery. They spoke in one voice. Your decision is our decision. It had been five days since Shiva had uprooted his tribe. The caravan had camped in a nook at the base of one of the great valleys, dotting the route to Meluha. Shiva had organized the camp in three concentric circles. The yaks had been tied around the outermost circle to act as an alarm in case of any intruders. The men were stationed in the intermediate ring to fight if there was a battle, and the women and children were in the innermost circle, just around the fire. Expendable first, defenders second, and the most vulnerable at the inside. Shiva was prepared for the worst. He believed that there would be an ambush. It was only a matter of time. The Pakritis should have been delighted to have access to the prime lands as well as free occupation of the lakefront. But Shiva knew that Yakya, the Pakriti chief, would not allow them to leave peacefully. Yakya would like nothing better than to become a legend by claiming that he had defeated Shiva's gunas and won the land for the Pakritis. It was precisely this weird tribal logic that Shiva detested. In an atmosphere like this, there was never any hope for peace. Shiva relished the call of battle, reveled in its art, but he also knew that ultimately the battles in his land were an exercise in futility. He turned to an alert Nandi sitting some distance away. The twenty-five Miluhan soldiers were seated in an arc around a second camp circle. Why did he pick the Gunas to immigrate? Why not the Pakritis? Shiva's thoughts were broken as he saw a shadow move in the distance. He stared hard, but everything was still. Sometimes the light played tricks in this part of the world. Shiva relaxed his stance. And then he saw the shadow again. To arms! screamed Shiva. The Gunas and the Meluhans drew their weapons and took up battle positions as 50 Pakritis charged in. The stupidity of rushing in without thought hit them hard as they met with a wall of panicky animals. The yaks bucked and kicked uncontrollably, injuring many Pakritis before they could even begin their skirmish. A few slipped through and weapons clashed. A young Pakriti, obviously a novice, charged at Shiva, swinging wildly. Shiva stepped back, avoiding the strike. He brought his sword back up in a smooth arc, inflicting a superficial cut on the Pakriti's chest. The young warrior cursed and swung back, opening his flank. That was all Shiva needed. He pushed his sword in brutally, cutting through the gut of his enemy. Almost instantly, he pulled the blade out, twisting it as he did, and left the Pakriti to a slow, painful death. Shiva turned around to find a Pakriti ready to strike a Guna. He jumped high and swung from the elevation, slicing neatly through the Pakriti's sword arm, severing it. Meanwhile, Bhadra, as adept in the art of battle as Shiva, was fighting two Pakritis simultaneously with a sword in each hand. His hump did not seem to impede his movements as he transferred his weight easily, striking the Pakriti on his left on his throat. Leaving him to die slowly, he swung with his right hand, cutting across the face of the other soldier, gouging his eye out. As the soldier fell, Bhadra brought his left sword down brutally, ending the suffering quickly for this hapless enemy. The battle at the Maluhan end of camp was very different. They were exceptionally well-trained soldiers, but they were not vicious. They were following rules, avoiding killing as far as possible. Outnumbered and poorly led, it was but a short while before the Pakritis were beaten. Almost half of them lay dead and the rest were on their knees begging for mercy. 
One of them was Yakya. His shoulder cut deep by Nandi, debilitating the movement of his sword arm. Badra stood behind the Pakriti chief, his sword raised high, ready to strike. Shiva, quick and easy or slow and painful? Sir, intervened Nandi before Shiva could speak. Shiva turned to the Meluhan. This is wrong. They are begging for mercy. Killing them is against the rules of war. You don't know the Pakriti, said Shiva. They are brutal. They will keep attacking us even when there is nothing to gain. This has to end once and for all. It is already ending. You are not going to live here anymore. You will soon be in Maluha. Shiva stood silent. Nandi continued. How you want to end this is up to you. More of the same or different. Badra looked at Shiva, waiting. You can show the Pakritis that you are better, said Nandi. Shiva turned towards the horizon, seeing the massive mountains. Destiny? Chance of a better life? He turned back to Bhadra. Disarm them. Take all their provisions. Release them. Even if the Pakritis are mad enough to go back to their village, rearm and come back, we would be long gone. A shocked Bhadra stared at Shiva, but immediately started implementing the order. Nandi gazed at Shiva with hope. There was but one thought that reverberated through his mind. Shiva has the heart. He has the potential. Please, let it be him. I pray to you, Lord Ram. Let it be him. Shiva walked back to the young soldier he had stabbed. He lay writhing on the ground, face contorted in pain, as blood oozed slowly out of his guts. For this first time in his life, Shiva felt pity for a Pakriti. He drew his sword and ended the young soldier's suffering. After marching continuously for four weeks, the caravan of invited immigrants crested the final mountain to reach the outskirts of Srinagar, the capital of the Valley of Kashmir. Nandi had talked excitedly about the glories of his perfect land. Shiva had prepared himself to see some incredible sights which he could not have imagined in his simple homeland. But nothing could have primed him for the sheer spectacle of what certainly was paradise. Meluha, the land of pure life. The mighty Jhelum River, a roaring tigress in the mountains, slowed down to the beat of a languorous cow as she entered the valley. She caressed the heavenly land of Kashmir, meandering her way into the immense dull lake. Further down, she broke away from the lake, continuing her journey to the sea. The vast valley was covered by a lush green canvas of grass. On it was painted the masterpiece that was Kashmir. Rows upon rows of flowers arrayed all of God's colours, their brilliance broken only by the soaring chinar trees, offering a majestic yet warm Kashmiri welcome. The melodious singing of the birds calmed the exhausted ears of Shiva's tribe, accustomed only to the rude howling of icy mountain winds. If this is the border province, how perfect must the rest of the country be, whispered Shiva in awe. The Dal Lake was a site of an ancient army camp of the Meluhans. Upon the western banks of the lake, by the side of the Jhelum, lay the frontier town that had grown beyond its simple encampments into the grand Srinagar, literally the respected city. Srinagar had been raised upon a massive platform of almost a hundred hectares in size. The platform built of earth towered almost five meters high. On top of the platform were the city walls, which were another twenty meters in height and four meters thick. The simplicity and brilliance of building an entire city on a platform astounded the Gunas. It was a strong protection against enemies who would have to fight up a fort wall, which was essentially solid ground. The platform served another vital purpose. It raised the ground level of the city, an extremely effective strategy against the recurrent floods in this land. Inside the fort walls, the city was divided into blocks by roads laid out in a neat grid pattern. It had specially constructed market areas, temples, gardens, meeting halls and everything else that would be required for sophisticated urban living. All the houses looked like simple multiple-storied block structures from the outside. The only way to differentiate a rich man's house was that his block would be bigger. In contrast to the extravagant natural landscape of Kashmir, the city of Srinagar itself was painted only in restrained greys, blues and whites. The entire city was a picture of cleanliness, order and sobriety. Nearly 20,000 souls called Srinagar their home. 
Now, an additional 200 had just arrived from Mount Kailash, and the leader felt a lightness of being he hadn't experienced since that terrible day many years ago. I have escaped. I can make a new beginning. I can forget. The caravan travelled to the immigrant camp outside Srinagar. The camp had been built on a separate platform on the southern side of the city. Nandi led Shiva and his tribe to the foreigner's office, which was placed just outside the camp. Nandi requested Shiva to wait outside as he went into the office. He soon returned, accompanied by a young official. The official gave a practiced smile and folded his hands in a formal namaste. Welcome to Meluha. I am Chitrangad. I will be your orientation executive. Think of me as your single point of contact for all issues while you are here. I believe your leader's name is Shiva. Will you step up, please? Shiva took a step forward. I am Shiva. Excellent, said Chitrangad. Would you be so kind as to follow me to the registration desk, please? You will be registered as the caretaker of your tribe. Any communication that concerns them will go through you. Since you are the designated leader, the implementation of all directives within your tribe would be your responsibility. Nandi cut into Chitrangad's officious speech to tell Shiva, Sir, if you will just excuse me, I will go to the immigrant camp quarters and arrange the temporary living arrangements for your tribe. Shiva noticed that Chitrangad's ever-beaming face had lost its smile for a fraction of a second as Nandi interrupted his flow. But he recovered quickly and the smile returned to his face once again. Shiva turned and looked at Nandi. Of course you may. You don't need to take my permission, Nandi, said Shiva. But in return, you have to promise me something, my friend. Of course, sir, replied Nandi, bowing slightly. Call me Shiva, not sir, grinned Shiva. I am your friend, not your chief. A surprised Nandi looked up, bowed again and said, Yes, sir, I mean, yes, Shiva. Shiva turned back to Chitrangad, whose smile for some reason appeared more genuine now. He said, Well, Shiva, if you will follow me to the registration desk, we will complete the formalities quickly. The newly registered tribe reached the residential quarters in the immigration camp to see Nandi waiting outside the main gates. He led them in. The roads of the camp were just like those of Srinagar. They were laid out in a neat north-south and east-west grid. The carefully paved footpaths contrasted sharply with the dirt tracks in Shiva's own land. He noticed something strange about the road, though. Nandi, what are those different coloured stones running through the centre of the road? asked Shiva. They cover the underground drains, Shiva. The drains take all the wastewater of the camp out. It ensures that the camp remains clean and hygienic. Shiva marvelled at the almost obsessively meticulous planning of the Meluhans. The Gunas reached the large building that had been assigned to them. For the umpteenth time, they thanked the wisdom of their leader in deciding to come to Meluha. The three-storied building had comfortable separate living quarters for each family. Each room had luxurious furniture, including a highly polished copper plate on the wall on which they could see their reflection. The rooms had clean linen bedsheets, towels and even some clothes. Feeling the cloth, a bewildered Shiva asked, What is this material? Chitrangad replied enthusiastically, It's cotton Shiva. The plant is grown in our lands and fashioned into the cloth that you hold. There was a broad picture window on each wall to allow the light and the warmth of the sun. Notches on each wall supported a metal rod with a controlled flame on top for lighting. Each room had an attached bathroom with a sloping floor that enabled the water to flow naturally to a hole which drained it out. At the right end of each bathroom was a paved basin on the ground which culminated in a large hole. The purpose of this contraption was a mystery to the tribe. The side walls had some kind of device which, when turned, allowed water to flow through. Magic, whispered Padra's mother. Beside the main door of the building was an attached house. A doctor and her nurses walked out of the house to greet Shiva. The doctor, a petite, wheat-skinned woman, was dressed in a simple white cloth tied around her waist and legs in a style the Meluhans called dhoti. A smaller white cloth was tied as a blouse around her chest, while another cloth, called an angvastram, was draped over her shoulders. The center of her forehead bore a white dot. Her head had been shaved clean, except for a knotted tuft of hair at the back, called a choti. A loose string, called a janeyu, 
was tied down from her left shoulder across her torso to the right side. Nandi was genuinely startled at seeing her. With a reverential namaste, he said, Lady Ayurvati, I didn't expect a doctor of your stature here. Ayurvati looked at Nandi with a smile and a polite namaste. I strongly believe in the fieldwork experience program, Captain. My team follows it strictly. However, I am terribly sorry, but I didn't recognize you. Have we met before? My name is Captain Nandi, my lady, answered Nandi. We haven't met, but who doesn't know you, the greatest doctor in the land? Thank you, Captain Nandi, said a visibly embarrassed Ayurvati. But I think you exaggerate. There are many far superior to me. Turning quickly towards Shiva, Ayurvati continued, Welcome to Meluha. I am Ayurvati, your designated doctor. My nurses and I will be at your assistance for the time that you are in these quarters. Hearing no reaction from Shiva, Chitrangad said in his most earnest voice, These are just temporary quarters, Shiva. The actual houses that will be allocated to your tribe will be much more comfortable. You have to stay here only for the period of the quarantine, which will not last more than seven days. Oh no, my friend, the quarters are more than comfortable. They are beyond anything that we could have imagined. What say, Mossy? grinned Shiva at Bhadra's mother, before turning back to Chitrangad with a frown. But why the quarantine? Nandi cut in. Shiva, the quarantine is just a precaution. We don't have too many diseases in Meluha. Sometimes immigrants may come in with new diseases. During the seven-day period, the doctors will observe and cure you of any such ailments. And one of the guidelines that you have to follow to control diseases is to maintain strict hygiene standards, said Ayurvati. Shiva grimaced at Nandi and whispered, Hygiene standards? Nandi's forehead crinkled into an apologetic frown while his hands gently advised acquiescence. He mumbled, Please go along with it, Shiva. It is just one of those things that we have to do in Meluha. Lady Ayurvati is considered to be the best doctor in the land. If you are free right now, I can give you your instructions, said Ayurvati. I am free right now, said Shiva with a straight face. But I may have to charge you later. Bhadra giggled softly, while Ayurvati stared at Shiva with a blank face, clearly not amused at the pun. I don't understand what you're trying to say, said Ayurvati frostily. In any case, we will begin at the bathroom. Ayurvati walked into the guest house, muttering under her breath, These uncouth immigrants. Shiva raised his eyebrows towards Bhadra, grinning impishly. Late in the evening, after a hearty meal, all the gunas were served a medicinal drink in their rooms. Yuck! grimaced Bhadra, his face contorted. This tastes like yak's piss. How do you know what yak's piss tastes like? laughed Shiva, as he slapped his friend hard in the back. Now, go to your room. I need to sleep. Have you seen the beds? I think this is going to be the best sleep of my life. I have seen the bed, damn it, grinned Shiva. Now I want to experience it. Get out! Bhadra left Shiva's room laughing loudly. He wasn't the only one excited by the unnaturally soft beds. Their entire tribe had rushed to their rooms for what they anticipated would be the most comfortable sleep of their lives. They were in for a surprise. Shiva tossed and turned on his bed constantly. He was wearing an orange-colored dhoti. The tiger's skin had been taken away to be washed, for hygienic reasons. His cotton angvastram was lying on a low chair by the wall. A half-lit chillum lay forlorn on the side table. This cursed bed is too soft, impossible to sleep on. Shiva yanked the bedsheet off the mattress, tossed it on the floor and lay down. This was a little better. Sleep was stealthily creeping in on him, but not as strongly as at home. He missed the rough cold floor of his own hut. He missed the shrill winds of Mount Kailash, which broke through the most determined efforts to ignore them. He missed the comforting stench of his tiger skin. No doubt, his current surroundings were excessively comfortable, but they were unfamiliar and alien. As usual, it was his instincts which brought up the truth. It's not the room, it's you. It was then that Shiva noticed that he was sweating. Despite the cool breeze, he was sweating profusely. The room appeared to be spinning lightly. He felt as if his body was being drawn out of itself. His frostbitten right toe felt as if it was on fire. His battle-scarred left knee seemed to be getting stretched. His tired and aching muscles felt as if a great hand was remoulding them. His shoulder bone, dislocated in days past and never completely healed, appeared to be ripping the muscles aside so as to re-engineer the joint. 
The muscles in turn seemed to be giving way to the bones to do their job. Breathing was an effort. He opened his mouth to help his lungs along, but not enough air flowed in. Shiva concentrated with all his might, opened his mouth wide and sucked in as much air as he could. The curtains by the side of the window rustled as a kindly wind rushed in. With a sudden gush of air, Shiva's body relaxed just a bit, and then the battle began again. He focused and willed giant gasps of air into his hungry body. Knock, knock. The light tapping on the door alerted Shiva. He was disoriented for a moment, still breathing hard. His shoulder was twitching. The familiar pain was missing. He looked down at his knee. It didn't hurt any more. The scar had vanished. Still gasping for breath, he looked down at his toe. Whole and complete now, he bent to check it. A cracking sound reverberated through the room as his toe made its first movement in years, still breathing hard. There was also an unfamiliar tingling coldness in his neck, very cold. Knock, knock, a little more insistent now. A bewildered shiver staggered to his feet, pulled the Angavastram around his neck for warmth and opened the door. The darkness veiled his face, but Shiva could still recognize Bhadra. He whispered in a panic-stricken voice, Shiva, I'm sorry to disturb you so late, but my mother has suddenly got a very high fever. What should I do? Shiva instinctively touched Bhadra's forehead. You too have a fever, Bhadra. Go to your room. I will get the doctor. As Shiva raced down the corridor towards the steps, he encountered many more doors opening with a now familiar message, Sudden fever! Help! Shiva sprinted down the steps to the attached building where the doctors were housed. He knocked hard on the door. Ayurvati opened it immediately as if she was expecting him. Shiva spoke calmly. Ayurvati, almost my entire tribe has suddenly fallen ill. Please come fast. They need help. Ayurvati touched Shiva's forehead. You don't have a fever? Shiva shook his head. No. Ayurvati frowned, clearly surprised. She turned and ordered her nurses. Come on, it's begun. Let's go. As Ayurvati and her nurses rushed into the building, Chitrangad appeared out of nowhere. He asked Shiva, What happened? I don't know. Practically everybody in my tribe suddenly fell ill. You too are sweating heavily. Don't worry, I don't have a fever. Look, I'm going back into the building. I want to see how my people are doing. Chitrangad nodded, adding, I'll call Nandi. As Chitrangad sped away in search of Nandi, Shiva ran into the building. He was surprised the moment he entered. All the torches in the building had been lit. The nurses were going from room to room, methodically administering medicines and advising the scared patients on what they should do. A scribe walked along with each nurse, meticulously noting the details of each patient on a palm leaf booklet. The Maluhans were clearly prepared for such an eventuality. Ayurvati stood at the end of the corridor, her hands on her hips, like a general supervising her superbly trained and efficient troops. Shiva rushed up to her and asked, What about the second and third floor? Ayurvati answered without turning to him. Nurses have already reached all over the building. I will go up to supervise once the situation on this floor has stabilized. We'll cover all the patients in the next half hour. You people are incredibly efficient, but I pray that everyone will be okay, said a worried Shiva. Ayurvati turned to look at Shiva. Her eyebrows were raised slightly, and a hint of a smile hovered on her serious face. Don't worry, we're Maluhans. We're capable of handling any situation. Everybody will be fine. Is there anything I can do to help? Yes. Please go take a bath. What? Please go take a bath right now, said Ayurvati, as she turned back to look at her team. Everybody, please remember that all children below the age of 15 must be tonsured. Mastruk, please go up and start the secondary medicines. I'll be there in five minutes. Yes, my lady, said a young man, as he hurried up the steps carrying a large cloth bag. You're still here? asked Ayurvati, as she noticed that Shiva hadn't left. Shiva spoke softly, controlling his rising anger. What difference would my bathing make? My people are in trouble. I want to help. I don't have the time or the patience to argue with you. You will go take a bath right now, said Ayurvati, clearly not trying to control her rising temper. Shiva glared at Ayurvati as he made a heroic effort to rein in the curses that wanted to leap out of his mouth. His clenched fists wanted to have an argument of their own with Ayurvati, but she was a woman. Ayurvati too glared back at Shiva. She was used to being obeyed. She was a doctor. If she told a patient to do something, she expected it to be done without question. 
but in her long years of experience, she had also seen few patients like Shiva, especially from the nobility. Such patients had to be reasoned with, not instructed. Yet this was a simple immigrant, not some nobleman. Controlling herself with great effort, Ayurvati said, Shiva, you are sweating. If you don't wash it off, it will kill you. Please trust me, you cannot be of any help to your tribe if you are dead. Chitrangad banged loudly on the door. A bleary-eyed Nandi woke up cursing. He wrenched the door open and growled, This better be important. Come quickly, Shiva's tribe has fallen ill. Already? But this is only the first night, exclaimed Nandi. Picking up his angvastram, he said, Let's go. The bathroom seemed a strange place for a bath. Shiva was used to splashing about in the chilly Mansarovar lake for his bi-monthly ablutions. The bathroom felt strangely constricted. He turned the magical device on the wall to increase the flow of water. He used the strange cake-like substance that the Maluhan said was a soap to rub the body clean. Ayurvati had been very clear. The soap had to be used. He turned the water off and picked up the towel. As he rubbed himself vigorously, the mystifying development he had ignored in the past few hours came flooding back. His shoulder felt better than new. He looked down in awe at his knee. No pain, no scar. He stared in wonder at his completely healed toe. Then he realized that it wasn't just the injured parts, but his entire body felt new, rejuvenated and stronger than ever. His neck, though, still felt intolerably cold. What the devil is going on? He stepped out of the bathroom and quickly wore a new dhoti. Again, Ayurvati's strict instructions were not to wear his old clothes, which were stained by his sweat. As he was putting on the angvastram around his neck for some warmth, there was a knock on the door. It was Ayurvati. Shiva, can you open the door, please? I just want to check whether you're all right. Shiva opened the door. Ayurvati stepped in and checked Shiva's temperature. It was normal. Ayurvati nodded slightly and said, You seem to be healthy, and your tribe is recovering quickly as well. The trouble has passed. Shiva smiled gratefully. Thanks to the skills and efficiency of your team. I am truly sorry for arguing with you earlier. It was unnecessary. I know you meant well. Ayurvati looked up from a palm leaf booklet with a slight smile and raised eyebrow. Being polite, are we? I'm not that rude, you know, grinned Shiva. You people are just too supercilious. Ayurvati suddenly stopped listening as she stared at Shiva with a stunned look on her face. How had she not noticed it before? She had never believed in the legend. Was she going to be the first one to see it come true? Pointing weakly with her hands, she mumbled, Why have you covered your neck? It's very cold for some reason. Is it something to get worried about? Asked Shiva as he pulled the angvastram off. A cry resounded loudly through the silent room as Ayurvati staggered back. Her hand covered her mouth in shock while the palm leaves scattered on the floor. Her knees were too weak to hold her up. She collapsed with her back against the wall, never once taking her eyes off Shiva. Tears broke through her proud eyes. She kept repeating, Om Brahmaya Nama, Om Brahmaya Nama. What's happened? Is it serious? asked a worried Shiva. You have come. My lord, you have come. Before a bewildered Shiva could react to a strange reaction, Nandi rushed in and noticed Ayurvati on the ground. Copious tears were flowing down her face. What happened, my lady? asked a startled Nandi. Ayurvati just pointed at Shiva's neck. Nandi looked up. The neck shone an eerie, iridescent blue. With a cry that sounded like that of a long-caged animal just released from captivity, Nandi collapsed on his knees. My lord, you have come! The Nilkant has come! The captain bent low and brought his head down to touch the Nilkant's feet reverentially. The object of his adoration, however, stepped back, befuddled and perturbed. What the hell is going on here? Shiva asked agitatedly. Holding a hand to his freezing neck, he turned around to the polished copper plate and stared in stunned astonishment at the reflection of his Neel Kant, his blue throat. Chitrangad, holding the door frame for support, sobbed like a child. We're saved! We're saved! He has come! Chapter 2 Land of Pure Life Chenadhwaj, the governor of Kashmir, wanted to broadcast to the entire world that the Nilkant had appeared in his capital city. 
not in the other frontier towns like Takshashila, Karachappa or Lothal. His Srinagar. But the bird courier had arrived almost immediately from the Meluhan capital Devagiri, the abode of the gods. The orders were crystal clear. The news of the arrival of the Nilkant had to be kept secret until the emperor himself had seen Shiva. Chenardhwaj was ordered to send Shiva along with an escort to Devagiri. Most importantly, Shiva himself was not to be told about the legend. The emperor will advise the supposed Nilkant in an appropriate manner, were the exact words in the message. Chenardhwaj had the privilege of informing Shiva about the journey. Shiva, though, was not in the most amenable of moods. He was utterly perplexed by the sudden devotion of every Maluhan around him. Since he had been transferred to the gubernatorial residence where he lived in luxury, only the most important citizens of Srinagar had access to him. My lord, we will be escorting you to Devagiri, our capital. It is a few weeks' journey from here, said Janardhwaj as he struggled to bend his enormous and muscular frame lower than he ever had. I am not going till somebody tells me what is going on. What the hell is this damned legend of the Nilkant? Shiva asked angrily. My lord, please have faith in us. You will know the truth soon. The emperor himself will tell you when you reach Devagiri. And what about my tribe? They will be given lands right here in Kashmir, my lord. All the resources that they need to lead a comfortable life will be provided for. Are they being held hostage? Oh no, my lord, said a visibly disturbed Janardhwaj. They are your tribe, my lord. If I had my way, they would live like nobility for the rest of their lives. But the laws cannot be broken, my lord, not even for you. We can only give them what had been promised. In the course of time, my lord, you can decide to change the laws you feel necessary. Then we could certainly accommodate them elsewhere. Please, my lord, pleaded Nandi, have faith in us. You cannot imagine how important you are to Meluha. We have been waiting for a very long time for you. We need your help. Please help me. Please. The memory of another desperate plea from a distraught woman years ago returned to haunt Shiva as he was stunned into silence. Your destiny is much larger than these massive mountains. Nonsense. I don't deserve any destiny. If these people knew my guilt, they would stop this bullshit instantly. I don't know what to do, Badra. Shiva was sitting in the royal gardens on the banks of the Dal Lake while his friends sat at his side carefully filling some marijuana into a chillum. As Bhadra used the lit stick to bring the chillum into life, Shiva said impatiently, That's a cue for you to speak, you fool. No, that's actually a cue for me to hand you the chillum, Shiva. Why will you not counsel me? asked Shiva in anguish. We are still the same friends who never made a move without consulting each other. Bhadra smiled. No, we are not. You are the chief now. The tribe lives and dies by your decisions. It cannot be corrupted by any other person's influence. We are not like the Pakritis, where the chief has to listen to whoever is a loudmouth on their council. Only the chief's wisdom is supreme amongst the Gunas. That is our tradition. Shiva raised his eyes in exasperation. Some traditions are meant to be broken. Padra stayed silent. Stretching his hand, Shiva grabbed the chillum from Padra. He took one deep puff, letting the marijuana spread its magnificence into his body. I've heard just one line about the legend of the Nilkant, said Badra. Apparently, Meluha is in deep trouble and only the Nilkant can save them. But I can't seem to see any trouble out here. Everything seems perfect. If they want to see real trouble, we should take them to our land. Badra laughed slightly. But what is it about the blue throat that makes them believe you can save them? Damned if I know. They are so much more advanced than us. And yet they worship me like I am some god just because of this blessed blue throat. I think their medicines are magical, though. Have you noticed that the hump on my back has reduced a little bit? Yes, it has. Their doctors are seriously gifted. You know, their doctors are called Brahmins. Like Ayurvati or Shiva, passing the chillum back to Bhadra. Yes, but the Brahmins don't just cure people. They're also teachers, lawyers, priests, basically any intellectual profession. Talented people, sniffed Shiva. That's not all, said Bhadra, in between a long inhalation. They have a concept of specialization. So in addition to the Brahmins, they have a group called Kshatriyas, who are the warriors and rulers. Even the women can be Kshatriyas. Really? They allow women into their army? Well, apparently there aren't too many female Kshatriyas. But yes, they're allowed into the army. No wonder they're in trouble. 
The friends laughed loudly at the strange ways of the Meluhans. Badra took another puff from the chillum before continuing his story. And then they have Vaishyas, who are craftsmen, traders and business people. And finally, the Shudras, who are the farmers and workers. And one caste cannot do another caste's job. Hang on, said Shiva. That means that since you are a warrior, you would not be allowed to trade at the marketplace. Yes. Bloody stupid. How would you get me my marijuana? After all, that's the only thing you're useful for. Shiva leaned back to avoid the playful blow from Bhadra. All right, all right, take it easy, he laughed. Stretching out, he grabbed the chillum from Bhadra and took another deep drag. We're talking about everything except what we should be talking about. Shiva became serious again. But seriously, strange as they are, what should I do? What are you thinking of doing? Shiva looked away as if contemplating the roses in the far corner of the garden. I don't want to run away once again. What? asked Bhadra, not hearing Shiva's tormented whisper clearly. I said, repeated Shiva loudly, I can't bear the guilt of running away once again. That wasn't your fault. Yes, it was. Padra felt silent. There was nothing that could be said. Covering his eyes, Shiva sighed once again. Yes, it was. Padra put his hand on his friend's shoulder, pressing it gently, letting the terrible moment pass. Shiva turned his face. I'm asking for advice, my friend. What should I do? If they need my help, I can't turn away from them. At the same time, how can I leave our tribe all by themselves out here? What should I do? Padra continued to hold Shiva's shoulder. He breathed deeply. He could think of an answer. It may have been the correct answer for Shiva, his friend. But was it the correct answer for Shiva, the leader? You have to find that wisdom yourself, Shiva. That is the tradition. Oh, the hell with you! Shiva threw the chillum back at Bhadra and stormed away. It was only a few days later that a minor caravan consisting of Shiva, Nandi and three soldiers was scheduled to leave Srinagar. The small party would ensure that they moved quickly through the realm and reach Devagiri as soon as possible. Governor Chenardhwaj was anxious for Shiva to be recognized quickly by the empire as a true Nilkant. He wanted to go down in history as the governor who found the Lord. Shiva had been made presentable for the emperor. His hair had been oiled and smoothened. Lines of expensive clothes, attractive earrings, necklaces and other jewellery were brought to adorn his muscular frame. His fair face had been scrubbed clean with special Ayurvedic herbs to remove years of dead skin and decay. A cravat had been fabricated out of cotton to cover his glowing blue throat. Beads had been cleverly darned onto the cravat to make it look like the traditional necklaces that Meluhan men wore while on religious exercises. The cravat felt warm on his still cold throat. I will be back soon, said Shiva, as he hugged Bhadra's mother. He was amazed that the old lady's limp was a little less noticeable. Their medicines are truly magical. As a morose Bhadra looked at him, Shiva whispered, Take care of the tribe. You are in charge till I come back. Bhadra stepped back, startled. Shiva, you don't have to do that just because I'm your friend. I have to do it, you fool. And the reason I have to do it is that you are more capable than me. Bhadra stepped up and embraced Shiva, lest his friend notice the tears at his eyes. No, Shiva, I am not. Not even in my dreams. Shut up. Listen to me carefully, said Shiva as Bhadra smiled sadly. I don't think the Gunas are at any risk out here. At least, not as much as we were at Mount Kailash. But even then, if you feel you need help, ask Ayurvedi. I saw her when the tribe was ill. She showed tremendous commitment to save us all. She is worth trusting. Bhadra nodded, hugged Shiva again and left the room. Ayurvedi knocked politely on the door. May I come in, my lord? This was the first time she had come into his presence since that fateful moment seven days back. It seemed like a lifetime to her. Though she appeared to be her confident self again, there was a slightly different look about her. She had the appearance of someone who had been touched by the divine. Come in, Ayurvati, and please, none of this lord business. I am still the same uncouth immigrant you met a few days ago. I am sorry about that comment, my lord. It was wrong of me to say that, and I am willing to accept any punishment that you may deem fit. What's wrong with you? Why should I punish you for speaking the truth? Why should this bloody blue throat change anything? You will discover the reason, my lord, whispered Ayurvati with a head bowed. We have waited for centuries for you. Centuries? In the name of the holy lake, why? 
What can I do that any of you smart people can't? The emperor will tell you, my lord. Suffice it to say that from all that I have heard from your tribe, if there is one person worthy of being the Nilkant, it is you. Speaking of my tribe, I have told them that if they need any help, they can request you. I hope that's all right. It would be my honour to provide any assistance to them, my lord. Saying this, she bent down to touch Shiva's feet in the traditional Indian form of showing respect. Shiva had resigned himself to accepting this gesture from most Meluans, but immediately stepped back as Ayurvati bent down. What the hell are you doing, Ayurvati? asked a horrified Shiva. You are a doctor, a giver of life. Don't embarrass me by touching my feet. Ayurvati looked up at Shiva, her eyes shining with admiration and devotion. This was certainly a man worthy of being the Nilkant. Nandi entered Shiva's room, carrying a saffron cloth with the word Ram stamped across every inch of it. He requested Shiva to wrap it around his shoulders. As Shiva complied, Nandi muttered a quick, short prayer for a safe journey to Devagiri. Our horses wait outside, my lord. We can leave when you are ready, said Nandi. Nandi, said an exasperated Shiva, how many times must I tell you? My name is Shiva. I am your friend, not your lord. Oh no, my lord, gasped Nandi. You are the Nilkant. You are the lord. How can I take your name? Shiva rolled his eyes, shook his head slightly and turned towards the door. I give up. Can we leave now? Of course, my lord. They stepped outside to see three mounted soldiers waiting patiently, while tethered close to them were three more horses, one each for Shiva and Nandi, while another assigned for carrying their provisions. The well-organized Meluhan Empire had rest houses and provision stores spread across all major travel routes. As long as there were enough provisions for just one day, a traveler carrying Meluhan coins could comfortably keep buying fresh provisions to last a journey of months. Nandi's horse had been tethered next to a small platform. The platform had steps leading up to it from the other side. Clearly, this was convenient infrastructure for obese riders who found it a little cumbersome to climb onto a horse. Shiva looked at Nandi's enormous form, then at his unfortunate horse and then back at Nandi. Aren't there any laws in Meluha against cruelty to animals? asked Shiva with the most sincere of expressions. Oh yes, my lord, very strict laws. In Meluha all life is precious. In fact, there are strict guidelines as to when and how animals can be slaughtered and... Suddenly, Nandi stopped speaking. Shiva's joke had finally breached Nandi's slow wit. They both burst out laughing as Shiva slapped Nandi hard on his back. Shiva's entourage followed the course of the Jhelum, which had resumed its thunderous roar as it crashed down the lower Himalayas. Once on the magnificent flat plains, the turbulent river calmed down once again and flowed smoothly on. Smooth enough for the group to get on one of the many public transport barges to sail quickly down to the town of Brihateshpuram. From there on, they went east by a well-laid and marked road through Punjab, the heart of the empire's northern reaches. Punjab literally meant the land of the five rivers. The land of the Indus, Jhelum, Chenab, Ravi and Bias. The four eastern rivers aspired to grasp the grand Indus, which flowed furthest to the west. They succeeded spectacularly after convoluted journeys on the rich plains of Punjab. The Indus itself found comfort and succour in the enormous, all-embracing ocean. The mystery of the ocean's final destination, though, was yet to be unravelled. What is Ram? inquired Shiva, as he looked down at the word covering every inch of his saffron cloth. The three accompanying soldiers rode at a polite distance behind Shiva and Nandi, far enough not to overhear any conversation, but close enough to move in quickly at the first sign of trouble. It was part of their standard Meluhan service rules. Lord Ram was the emperor who established our way of life, my lord, replied Nandi. He lived around 1,200 years ago. He created our systems, our rules, our ideologies, everything. His reign is known simply as Ram Raja or the rule of Ram. The term Ram Raja is considered to be the gold standard of how an empire must be administered to create a perfect life for all its citizens. Meluha is still run according to his principles. Jai Shri Ram. He must have been quite a man, for he truly created a paradise right here on earth. Shiva did not lie when he said this. He truly believed that if there was a paradise somewhere, 
It couldn't have been very different from Meluha. This was a land of abundance, of almost ethereal perfection. It was an empire ruled by clearly codified and just laws, to which every Maluhan was subordinated, including the emperor. The country supported a population of nearly eight million, which, without exception, seemed well-fed, healthy, and wealthy. The average intellect was exceptionally high. They were a slightly serious people, but unfailingly polite and civil. It seemed to be a flawless society, where everyone knew his role and played it perfectly. They were conscious, nay obsessive, about their duties. The simple truth hit Shiva. If the entire society was conscious of its duties, nobody would need to fight for their individual rights, since everybody's rights would be automatically taken care of through someone else's duties. Lord Ram was a genius. Shiva too repeated Nandi's cry, signifying glory to Lord Ram. Jai Shri Ram! Having left their horses at the government-authorized crossing house, they crossed the river Ravi, close to Haryapa, or the city of Hari. Shiva lingered there, admiring Haryapa at a slight distance, while his soldiers waited just beyond his shadow, having mounted their freshly allocated horses from the crossing house on the other side of the Ravi. Haryapa was a much larger city than Srinagar, and seemed grand from the outside. Shiva thought seriously about exploring the magnificent city, but that would have meant a delay in the trip to Devagiri. Next to Haryapa, Shiva saw a construction project being executed. A new platform was being erected as Haryapa had grown too populous to accommodate everyone on its existing platform. How the hell do they raise these magnificent platforms? Shiva made a mental note to visit the construction site on his return journey. At a distance, Jata, the captain of the river crossing house, was talking to Nandi while he was about to climb the platform to mount his fresh horse. Avoid the road via Jratagiri, advised Jatar. There was a terrorist attack there last night. All the Brahmins were killed and the village temple was destroyed. The terrorists escaped as usual before any backup soldiers could arrive. When in Lord Agni's name will we fight back? We should attack their country, snarled a visibly angry Nandi. I swear by Lord Indra, if I ever find one of these Chandravanshi terrorists, I will cut his body into minute pieces and feed it to the dogs growled Jata, clenching his fists tight. Jata, we are followers of the Surya Vanshis. We cannot even think of barbaric warfare such as that, said Nandi. Do the terrorists follow the rules of war when they attack us? Don't they kill unarmed men? That does not mean that we can act the same way, Captain. We are Meluhans, said Nandi, shaking his head. Jata did not counter Nandi. He was distracted by Shiva still waiting at a distance. Is he with you? he asked. Yes. He doesn't wear a caste amulet. Is he a new immigrant? Yes, replied Nandi, getting uncomfortable answering questions about Shiva. And you're going to Devagiri, said an increasingly suspicious Jatar, looking harder towards Shiva's throat. I've heard some rumours coming from Srinagar. Nandi interrupted Jatar suddenly. Thank you for your help, Captain Jatar. Before Jatar could act on his suspicions, Nandi quickly climbed the platform, mounted his horse and rode towards Shiva. Reaching quickly, he said, We should leave, my lord. Shiva wasn't listening. He was perplexed once again as he saw the proud Captain Jata on his knees. Jata was looking directly at Shiva with his hands folded in a respectful namaste. He appeared to be mumbling something very quickly. Shiva couldn't be sure from that distance, but it seemed that the captain was crying. He shook his head and whispered, Why? We should go, my lord, repeated Nandi a little louder. Shiva turned to him, nodded and kicked his horse into action. Shiva looked to his left as he rode on the straight road, observing Nandi goading his valiant horse along. He turned around and was not surprised to see his three bodyguard soldiers riding at exactly the same distance as before, not too close and yet not too far. He glanced back at Nandi, suspicious that the jewellery Nandi wore was not merely ornamental. He wore two amulets on his thick right arm. The first one had some symbolic lines which Shiva could not fathom. The second one appeared to have an animal etching, probably a bull. One of his gold chains had a pendant shaped like a perfectly circular sun with rays streaming outwards. The other pendant was a brown, elliptical, seed-like object with small serrations all over it. Can you tell me the significance of your jewellery or is that also a state secret? teased Shiva. Of course I can, my lord, replied Nandi earnestly. He pointed at the first amulet, 
that had been tied around his massive arm with a silky gold thread. This is the amulet which represents my caste. The lines drawn on it are a symbol of the shoulders of the Paramatma, the Almighty. This means that I am a Kshatriya. I am sure there are other clearly codified guidelines for representing the other castes as well. Right you are, my lord. You are exceptionally intelligent. No, I am not. You people are just exceptionally predictable. Nandi smiled as Shiva continued. So, what are they? What are what, my lord? The symbols for the Brahmins, Vaishyas and Shudras. Well, if the lines are drawn to represent the head of the Paramatma, it would mean the wearer is a Brahmin. The symbol for a Vaishya would be the lines forming a symbol of the thighs of the Paramatma. And the feet of the Paramatma on the amulet would make the wearer a Shudra. Interesting, said Shiva with a slight frown. I imagine most Shudras are not too pleased about their placement. Nandi was quite surprised at Shiva's comments. He couldn't understand why a Shudra would have a problem with this long-ordained symbol. But he kept quiet for fear of disagreeing with his lord. And the other amulet? asked Shiva. This second amulet depicts my chosen tribe. Each chosen tribe takes on jobs which fit its profile. Every Maluhan, under the advice of their parents, apply for a chosen tribe when they turn 25 years old. Brahmins choose from birds, while Kshatriyas apply for animals. Flowers are allocated to Vaishyas, while Shudras must choose among fishes. The allocation board allocates the chosen tribe on the basis of a rigorous examination process. You must qualify for a chosen tribe that represents both your ambitions and skills. Choose a tribe that is too mighty and you will embarrass yourself throughout your life if your achievements don't measure up to the standards of that tribe. Choose a tribe too lowly and you will not be doing justice to your own talents. My chosen tribe is a bull. That is the animal that this amulet represents. And if I am not being rude, what does a bull mean in your rank of Kshatriya chosen tribes? Well, it's not as high as a lion, tiger or an elephant, but it's not a rat or a pig either. Well, as far as I am concerned, the bull can beat any lion or elephant, smiled Shiva. And what about the pendants on your chain? The brown seed is a representation of the last Mahadev, Lord Rudra. It symbolizes the protection and regeneration of life. Even divine weapons cannot destroy the life it protects. And the sun? My lord, the sun represents the fact that I am a follower of the Suryavanshi kings, the kings who are the descendants of the sun. What? The sun came down and some queen teased an incredulous shiver. Of course not, my lord, laughed Nandi. All it means is that we follow the solar calendar. So you could say that we are the followers of the path of the sun. In practical terms, it denotes that we are strong and steadfast. We honor our word and keep our promises even at the cost of our lives. We never break the law. We deal honorably even with those who are dishonorable. Like the sun, we never take from anyone but always give to others. We sear our duties into our consciousness so that we may never forget them. Being a Surya Vanshi means that we must always strive to be honest, brave and above all loyal to the truth. A tall order. I assume that Lord Ram was a Surya Vanshi king. Yes, of course, replied Nandi, his chest puffed up with pride. He was the Surya Vanshi king. Jai Shri Ram! Jai Shri Ram, repeated Shiva. Nandi and Shiva crossed the river Bias on a boat. Their three soldiers waited to cross on the following craft. The Bias was the last river to be crossed, after which stretched the straight road towards Devagiri. Unseasonal rain the previous night had made the crossing house captain consider cancelling the day's crossing across the river. However, the weather had been relatively calm since the morning, allowing the captain to keep the service operational. Shiva and Nandi shared the boat with two other passengers, as well as the boatmen who rowed them across. They had traded in their existing horses at the crossing house for fresh horses on the other side. They were a short distance from the opposite bank when a sudden burst of torrential rain came down from the heavens. The winds took on a sudden ferocity. The boatman made a valiant effort to row quickly across, but the boat tossed violently as it surrendered to the elements. Nandi stretched to tell Shiva to stay low for safety, but he did not do it gently enough. His considerable weight caused the boat to list dangerously, and he fell overboard. The boatman tried to steady the boat with his oars to save the other passengers. Even as he did so, he had the presence of mind to pull out his conch and blow an emergency call to the crossing house on the other side. The other two passengers should have jumped overboard to save Nandi, 
but his massive build made them hesitate. They knew that if they tried to save him, they would most likely drown. Shiva felt no such hesitation as he quickly tossed aside his Angavastram, pulled off his shoes and dived into the turbulent river. Shiva swam with powerful strokes and quickly reached a rapidly drowning Nandi. He had to use all of his considerable strength to pull Nandi to the surface. In spite of being buoyed by the water, Nandi weighed significantly more than what any normal man would. It was fortunate that Shiva felt stronger than ever since the first night at the Srinagar immigration camp. Shiva positioned himself behind Nandi and wrapped one arm around his chest. He used his other arm to swim to the bank. Nandi's weight made it very exhausting work, but Shiva was able to tow the Maluhan captain to the shore soon as the emergency staff from the crossing house came rapidly towards them. Shiva helped them drag Nandi's limp body onto the land. He was unconscious. The emergency staff then began a strange procedure. One of them started pressing Nandi's chest in a quick rhythmic motion to the count of five. The moment he would stop, other emergency staff would cover Nandi's lips with his own and breathe hard into his mouth. Then they would repeat the procedure all over again. Shiva did not understand what was going on, but trusted both the knowledge as well as the commitment of the Meluhan medical personnel. After several anxious moments, Nandi suddenly coughed up a considerable amount of water and woke up with a start. At first, he was disoriented, but he quickly regained his wits and turned abruptly towards Shiva, screeching, My Lord, why did you jump in after me? Your life is too precious. You must never risk it for me. A surprised Shiva supported Nandi's back and whispered calmly, You need to relax, my friend. Agreeing with Shiva, the medical staff quickly placed Nandi on a stretcher to carry him into the rest house that was attached to the crossing house. The other boat passengers were looking at Shiva with increasing curiosity. They knew that the fat man was a relatively senior Suryavanshi soldier, judging by his amulets. Yet he called this fair, caste, unmarked man his lord. Strange. But all that mattered was that the soldier was safe. They dispersed as Shiva followed the medical staff into the rest house. Chapter 3 She Enters His Life Nandi lay in a semi-conscious state for several hours as the medicines administered by the doctors worked on his body. Shiva sat by his side, repeatedly changing the wet cloth on his burning forehead to control the fever. Nandi kept babbling incoherently as he tossed and turned in his sleep, making Shiva's task that much more difficult. I have been searching long, so long. A hundred years. Never thought I find Nilkant. Jai Shri Ram. Shiva tried to ignore Nandi's babble as he focused on keeping the fever down, but his ears had caught to something. He's been searching for a hundred years? Shiva frowned. The fever's affecting his bloody brain. He doesn't look a day older than twenty years. I've, I've been searching for a hundred years. Continued the oblivious Nandi. I found Nilkant. Shiva stopped for a moment and stared hard at Nandi. Then shaking his head dismissively, he continued his ministrations. Shiva had been walking on a paved, signposted road along the river Bias for a better part of an hour. He had left the rest house to explore the area by himself, much against a rapidly recovering Nandi's advice. Nandi was out of danger but they had to wait for a few days nevertheless so that the captain could be strong enough to travel. There was not much Shiva could do at the rest house and he had begun to feel restless. The three soldiers had tried to shadow Shiva but he had angrily dismissed them. Will you please stop trying to stick to me like leeches? The rhythmic hymns sung by the gentle waters of the Bias soothed Shiva. A cool tender breeze teased his thick lock of hair. He rested his hand on the hilt of his scabbard as his mind swirled with persistent questions. Is Nandi really more than a hundred years old? But that's impossible! And what the hell do these crazy Meluhans need me for anyway? And why in the name of the Holy Lake is my bloody throat still feeling so cold? Lost in his thoughts, Shiva did not realize that he had strayed off the road into a clearing. Staring him in the face was the most beautiful building he had ever seen. It was built entirely with white and pink marble. An imposing flight of stairs led up to the top of a high platform, which had been adorned by pillars around its entire circumference. 
The ornate roof was topped by a giant triangular spire, like a giant namaste to the gods. Elaborate sculptures were carved upon every available space on the structure. Shiva had spent many days in Meluha, and all the buildings he had seen so far were functional and efficient. However, this particular one was oddly flamboyant. At the entrance, a signpost announced, Temple of Lord Brahma. The Meluhans appeared to reserve their creativity for religious places. There was a small crowd of hawkers around the courtyard in the clearing. Some were selling flowers, others were selling food, still others were selling assorted items required for a puja. There was a stall where worshippers could leave their footwear as they went up to the temple. Shiva left his shoes there and walked up the steps. Entering the main temple, he stared at the designs and sculptures, mesmerized by the sheer magnificence of the architecture. What are you doing here? Shiva turned around to find a pandit staring at him quizzically. His wizened face sported a flowing white beard, matched in length only by his silvery mane. Wearing a saffron dhoti and angvastram, he had the calm, gentle look of a man who had already attained nirvana, but had chosen to remain on earth to fulfill some heavenly duties. Shiva realized that the pandit was the first truly old person that he had seen in Meluha. I am sorry, am I not allowed in here? asked Shiva politely. Of course you are allowed in here. Everyone is allowed into the house of the gods. Shiva smiled. Before he could respond, however, the pandit questioned once again. But you don't believe in these gods, do you? Shiva's smile disappeared as quickly as it came. How the hell does he know? The pandit answered the question in Shiva's eyes. Everyone who enters this place of worship looks only at the idol of Lord Brahma. Almost nobody notices the efforts and the brilliance of the architects who built this lovely temple. You, however, have eyes only for the work of the architects. You have not yet cast even a glance upon the idol. Shiva grinned apologetically. You guessed right. I don't believe in symbolic gods. I believe that the real god exists all around us. In the flow of the river, in the rustle of the trees, in the whisper of the winds. He speaks to us all the time. All we need to do is listen. However, I apologize if I have caused some offense in not showing proper respect for your god. You don't need to apologize, my friend, smiled the pundit. There is no your god or my god. All godliness comes from the same source. Just the manifestations are different. But I have a feeling that one day you will find a temple worth walking into just for prayer, not to admire its beauty. Really? Which temple might that be? You will find it when you are ready, my friend. Why do these Meluhans always talk in bizarre riddles? Shiva nodded politely, his expression pretending an appreciation for the pundit's words that he did not truly feel. He thought it wise to flee the temple before his welcome was stretched any further. It's time to get back to my rest house now, Panditji. But I eagerly look forward to finding the temple of my destiny. It was a pleasure meeting you, said Shiva as he bent down to touch the pundit's feet. Placing his hand on Shiva's head, the pundit said gently, Jai Guru Vishwamitra, Jai Guru Vashishta. Shiva rose, turned and walked down the steps. Looking at Shiva walking away from him, clearly out of earshot, the pundit whispered with an admiring smile, for he had recognized his fellow traveller in karma. Pleasure was all mine, my karma sati. Shiva reached the shoe stall, put on his shoes and offered a coin for the service. The shoekeeper politely declined. Thank you, sir, but this is a service provided by the government of Meluha. There is no charge for it. Shiva smiled. Of course, you people have a system for everything. Thank you. The shoekeeper smiled back. We are only doing our duty, sir. Shiva walked back to the temple steps. As he sat down, he breathed in deeply and let the tranquil atmosphere suffuse him with its serenity. And then it happened. The moment that every unrealized heart craves for, the unforgettable instant that a soul, clinging on to the purest memory of its previous life, longs for. The second that in spite of a conspiracy of the gods, only a few lucky men experience. The moment when she enters his life. She rode in on a chariot, guiding the horses expertly into the courtyard, while a lady companion by her side held on to the railings. 
Although her black hair was tied in an understated bun, a few irreverent strands danced a spell-binding kathak in the wind. Her piercingly magnetic blue eyes and bronzed skin were an invitation for jealousy from the goddesses. Her body, though covered demurely in a long angvastram, still ignited Shiva's imagination enough to sense the lovely curves which lay beneath. Her flawless face was a picture of concentration as she maneuvered the chariot skillfully into its parking place. She dismounted the chariot with an air of confidence. It was a calm confidence which had not covered the ugly distance towards arrogance. Her walk was dignified. Stately enough to let a beholder know that she was detached but not cold. Shiva stared at her like a parched piece of earth mesmerized by a passing rain cloud. Have mercy on me. My lady, I still feel it's not wise to wander so far from the rest of your entourage, said her companion. She answered, Kritika, just because others don't know the law doesn't mean that we can ignore it. Lord Ram clearly stated that once a year a pious woman has to visit Lord Brahma. I will not break that law, no matter how inconvenient it is to the bodyguards. The lady noticed Shiva staring at her as she passed by him. Her delicate eyebrows arched into a surprised and annoyed frown. Shiva made a valiant attempt to tear his glance away, but realized that his eyes were no longer in his control. She continued walking up, followed by Kritika. She turned round at the top of the temple steps to see the caste unmarked immigrant at a distance, still staring at her unabashedly. Before turning to walk into the main temple, she muttered to Kritika, These uncouth immigrants, as if we'll ever find our saviour amongst these barbarians. It was only when she was out of sight that Shiva could breathe again. As he desperately tried to gather his wits, his overwhelmed and helpless mind took one obvious decision. There was no way he was leaving the temple before getting another look at her. He sat down on the steps once again. As his breathing and heartbeat returned to normal, he finally began to notice the surroundings that had been consecrated by her recent presence. He stared once again at the road on the left from where she had turned in. She had ridden past the cucumber cellar standing near the banyan tree. Incidentally, why is the cucumber seller not trying to hawk his wares? He just seems to be staring at the temple. Anyway, it's not any of my concern. He followed the path that her chariot had taken as it had swerved to its left around the fountain at the centre of the courtyard. It had then taken a sharp right turn past the shepherd standing at the entrance of the garden. Incidentally, where were this shepherd's sheep? Shiva continued to look down the path the chariot had taken into the parking lot. Next to the chariot stood another man who had just walked into the temple complex, but had inexplicably not entered the temple itself. He turned to the shepherd and appeared to nod slightly. Before Shiva could piece together the information that he had just seen, he felt her presence again. He turned immediately to see her walking down the steps, with Kritika walking silently behind. Still finding this rude, caste unmarked, obviously foreign man staring at her, she walked up to him and asked in a firm but polite voice, Excuse me, is there a problem? No, no, there's no problem. I just felt that I'd seen you before somewhere, replied a flustered Shiva. The lady was not sure how to respond to this. It was obviously a lie, but there appeared to be a sincere voice behind it. Before she could react, Kritika cut in rudely. Is that the best line you could come up with? As Shiva was about to retort, he was alerted by a quick movement from the cucumber seller. Shiva turned to see him, pulling out a sword as he tossed his shawl aside. The shepherd and the man next to the chariot also stood poised in traditional fighter positions with their swords drawn. Shiva immediately drew his sword and stretched out his left hand protectively to pull the object of his fascination behind him. She, however, deftly sidestepped his protective hand, reached into the folds of her angavastram and drew out her own sword. Shiva glanced at her, surprised, and flashed her a quick, admiring smile. Her eyes flashed right back, acknowledging the unexpected yet providential partnership. She whispered under her breath to Kritika, Run back into the temple. Stay there till this is over. Kritika protested, But my lady, now, she ordered. Kritika turned and ran up the temple steps. Shiva and the lady stood back to back in a standard defensive partner position. They covered all the directions of any possible attack. The three attackers charged in. Two more jumped in from behind the trees to join the other three. Shiva raised his sword defensively as a shepherd came up close. 
Feigning a sideward movement to draw the shepherd into an aggressive attack, Shiva dropped his sword low. The shepherd should have been tempted to move in for a kill wound and in response, Shiva would have quickly raised his sword and dug it deep into the shepherd's heart. The shepherd, however, moved unexpectedly. Instead of taking advantage of Shiva's opening, he tried to strike Shiva's shoulder. Shiva quickly raised his right arm and swung viciously, inflicting a deep wound across the shepherd's torso. As the shepherd fell back, another attacker moved in from the right. He swung from a distance. Not too smart a move, as it would merely have inflicted a surface nick. Shiva stepped back to avoid the swing and brought his sword down in a smooth action to dig deep into the attacker's thigh. Screaming in agony, this attacker too fell back. As another attacker joined in the fight from the left, Shiva realized that this was indeed a very strange assault. The attackers seemed to know what they were doing. They seemed to be good warriors. But they also seemed to be in a bizarre dance of avoidance. They did not appear to want to kill, merely injure. It was because they held themselves in check that they were being beaten back very easily. Shiva parried off another attack from the left and pushed his sword viciously into the man's shoulder. The man screamed in pain as Shiva pushed him off the blade with his left hand. Slowly but surely, the attackers were being worn out. They were suffering too many injuries to seriously carry on the assault for long. Suddenly, a giant of a man ran in from behind the trees, carrying swords in both hands. The man was cloaked in a black hooded robe from head to toe, while his face was hidden by a black mask shaped exactly like a human face. The only visible parts of his body were his large, impassive, almond-shaped eyes and strong, fleshy hands. He charged upon Shiva and the lady as he barked an order to his men. He was too large to battle with agility, but he compensated for his slow pace with his unusually skilled arms. Shiva registered from the corner of his eye that the other attackers were picking up the injured and withdrawing. The hooded figure was fighting a brilliant rearguard action as his men retreated. Shiva realized that the man's hood would impair his side vision. That was a weakness that could be exploited. Moving to the left, Shiva swung ferociously, hoping to peg him back so that the lady could finish the job from the other side. But his opponent was up to the challenge. As he stepped slightly back, he deflected Shiva's swing with a deft move of his right hand. Shiva noticed a leather band on the hooded figure's right wrist. It had a sharp symbol on it. Shiva swung his sword back, but the hooded figure moved aside effortlessly to avoid the blow. He pushed back a brutal flanking attack from the lady with his left hand. He was keeping just enough distance from Shiva and the lady to defend himself while at the same time keeping them engaged in combat. All of a sudden, the hooded figure disengaged from the battle and stepped back. He began to tread backwards as he continued to point both his swords ahead, one at Shiva and the other at the lady. His men had all disappeared into the trees. As he reached a safe distance, he turned and ran behind his men. Shiva considered chasing him, but almost immediately decided against it. He might just rush into an ambush. Shiva turned to the lady warrior and inquired, Are you alright? Yes, I am, she nodded before asking with a somber expression. Are you injured? Nothing serious. I'll survive, he grinned. In the meantime, Kritika came running down the temple steps and asked breathlessly, My lady, are you alright? Yes, I am, she answered, thanks to this foreigner here. Kritika turned to Shiva and said, Thank you very much. You have helped a very important woman. Shiva did not seem to be listening, though. He continued to stare at Kritika's mistress as if he was possessed. Kritika struggled to conceal a smile. The noble woman averted her eyes in embarrassment, but said politely, I am sorry, but I am quite sure that we have not met earlier. No, it's not that, said a smiling Shiva. It's just that in our society, women don't fight. You move your sword quite well for a woman. Oh, hell, that came out all wrong. Excuse me, she said, a slightly belligerent tone in her voice, clearly upset about that for a woman remark. You don't fight too badly either for a barbarian. Not too badly. I'm an exceptional sword fighter. Do you want to try me? Oh, bloody hell, what am I saying? I'm not going to impress her like this. Her expression resumed its detached, supercilious look once again. I have no interest in dueling with you, foreigner. No, no, d d don't get me wrong. I didn't want to duel with you. I just wanted to tell you that I'm quite good at sword fighting. I'm good at other things as well. And it came out all wrong. I rather like the fact that you fought for yourself. You're a very good swordsman. I mean, a swordswoman. In fact, you're quite a woman, bumbled Shiva, losing the filter of judgment exactly at the time when he needed it the most. 
Kritika, with head bowed, smiled at the increasingly appealing exchange. Her mistress, on the other hand, wanted to chastise the foreigner for his highly inappropriate words, but he had saved her life. She was bound by the Meluhan code of conduct. Thank you for your help, foreigner. I owe you my life, and you will not find me ungrateful. If you ever need my help, do call on me. Can I call on you even if I don't need your help? Shit! What am I saying? She glared at the cast unmarked foreigner who clearly did not know his place. With superhuman effort, she controlled herself, nodded politely, and said, Namaste. With that, the aristocratic woman turned around to leave. Kritika continued to stare at Shiva with admiring eyes. However, on seeing her mistress leaving, she too turned hurriedly to follow. At least tell me your name, said Shiva, walking to keep pace with her. She turned around, staring even more gravely at Shiva. Look, how will I find you if I need your help? asked Shiva sincerely. For a moment, she was out of words or a glare. The request seemed reasonable. She turned towards Kritika and nodded. You can find us at Devagiri, answered Kritika. Ask anyone in the city for Lady Sati. Sati, said Shiva, letting the ethereal name roll over his tongue. My name is Shiva. Namaste, Shiva, and I promise you I will honor my word if you ever need my help, said Sati, as she turned and climbed into a chariot, followed by Kritika. Expertly turning the chariot, Sati urged her horses into a smooth trot. Without a backward look, she sped away from the temple. Shiva kept staring at the disappearing profile of the chariot. Once it was gone, he continued to stare at the dust with intense jealousy. It had been fortunate enough to have touched her. I think I'm going to like this country. For the first time in the journey, Shiva actually looked forward to reaching the capital city of the Meluhans. He smiled and started towards the rest house. Have to get to Devagiri, quickly! Chapter 4 Abode of the Gods What? Who attacked you? cried a concerned Nandi as he rushed towards Shiva to check his wounds. Relax, Nandi, replied Shiva. You are in worse shape than I am after your adventure in the water. It's just a few superficial cuts, nothing serious. The doctors have already dressed the wounds. I'm all right. I'm sorry, my lord. It's entirely my fault. I should never have left you alone. It will never happen again. Please forgive me, my lord. Pushing Nandi gently back onto the bed, Shiva said, There's nothing to forgive, my friend. How can this be your fault? Please calm down. Getting overworked will not do your health any good. Once Nandi had calmed down a bit, Shiva continued, In any case, I don't think they were trying to kill us. It was very strange. Us? Yes, there were two women involved. But who could these attackers be? asked Nandi. Then, as a disturbing thought dawned on Nandi, did the attackers wear a pendant with a crescent moon on it? Shiva frowned. No, but there was this one strange man, the best swordsman of them all. He was covered from head to toe in a hooded robe, his face veiled by a mask, the kind I've seen you people wear at that colour festival. What's it called? Holy, my lord? Yes, the holy kind of mask. In any case, you could only see his eyes and his hands. His only distinguishing feature was a leather bracelet with a strange symbol on it. What symbol, my lord? Picking up a palm-leaf booklet and the thin charcoal writing stick from the side table, Shiva drew the symbol. Nandi frowned. That's an ancient symbol that some people used for the word Om. But who would want to use the symbol now? Om? asked Shiva. My lord, Om is the holiest word in our religion. It is considered to be the primeval sound of nature, the hymn of the universe. It was so holy that for many millennia most people would not insult it by putting it down in written form. Then how did this symbol come about? It was devised by Lord Bharat, a great ruler who had conquered practically all of India many thousands of years ago. He was a rare Chandravanshi who was worth respecting and had even married a Suryavanshi princess with the aim of ending our perpetual war. Who are the Chandravanshis? asked Shiva. Think of them as a very antithesis of us, my lord. They are the followers of the kings who are the descendants of the moon. And they follow the lunar calendar? Yes, my lord. They are a crooked, untrustworthy and lazy people with no rules, morals or honor. They are cowards and never attack like principled Kshatriyas. Even their kings are corrupt and selfish. The Chandravanshis are a blot on humanity. But what does the Om symbol have to do with this? Well. 
King Bharat came up with this symbol of unity between the Surya Vanshis and the Chandra Vanshis. The top half in white represented the Chandra Vanshis, the bottom half in red represented the Surya Vanshis. The part in orange coming out of the meeting of these two parts represented the common path. The crescent moon to the right of the symbol was the existing Chandra Vanshi symbol, and the sun above it was the existing Surya Vanshi symbol. To signify that this was a pact blessed by the gods, Lord Bharat got a mandate for the pronunciation of this symbol as the holy word Om. And then what happened? As expected, the pact died with the good king. Once the influence of Lord Bharat was gone, the Chandravanshis were up to their old ways and the war began once again. The symbol was forgotten and the word Om reverted to its original form of a word without written representation. But the symbol on the bracelet of this hooded man was not coloured. It was all black. And the parts of the symbol didn't look like lines to me. They looked like drawings of three serpents. Naga! exclaimed a shocked Nandi, before mumbling a soft prayer and touching his Rudra pendant for protection. Now who the bloody hell are the Nagas? asked Shiva. They are a cursed people, my lord, gasped Nandi. They are born with hideous deformities because of the sins of their previous births. Deformities like extra hands or horribly misshapen faces. But they have tremendous strength and skills. The Naga name alone strikes terror in any citizen's heart. They are not even allowed to live in the Sapt Sindhu. The Sapt Sindhu? Our land, my lord, the land of the seven rivers. The land of the Indus, Saraswati, Yamuna, Ganga, Sarayu, Brahmaputra and Narmada. This is where Lord Manu mandated that all of us, Suryavanshis and Chandravanshis, live. Shiva nodded as Nandi continued. The city of the Nagas exists to the south of the Narmada, beyond the border of our lands. In fact, it is bad luck to even speak of them, my lord. But why would a Naga attack me, or any Maluhan for that matter? Cursing under his breath, Nandi said, Because of the Chandravanshis. What levels have these two-faced people sunk to? using the demon Nagas and their attacks. In their hatred for us, they don't even realize how many sins they are inviting on their own souls. Shiva frowned. During the attack, it hadn't appeared that the Naga was being used by the small platoon of soldiers. In fact, it looked to him like the Naga was the leader. It took another week for them to reach Devagiri. The capital city of the Maluhans stood on the west bank of the Saraswati, which emerged at the confluence of the Satluj and Yamuna rivers. Sadly, the Saraswati's flow was severely reduced compared to her once mighty size. But even in her abbreviated state, she was still massive and awe-inspiring. Unlike many of the tempestuous rivers of the Punjab, the Saraswati was achingly calm. The river seemed to sense that her days were coming to an end. Yet, she did not fight aggressively to thrust her way through and survive. Instead, she unselfishly gave her all to those who came to seek her treasures. The soaring Devagiri, though, was in complete contrast to the mellow Saraswati. Like all Meluhan cities, Devagiri too was built on giant platforms, an effective protection against floods and a sturdy defence against enemies. However, where Devagiri was different from other Meluhan cities was its sheer size. The city sprawled over three giant platforms, each of them spreading over 350 hectares, significantly larger than the other cities. The platforms were nearly eight meters high and were bastioned with giant blocks of cut stone interspaced with baked bricks. Two of the platforms, named Tamra and Rajat, literally bronze and silver, were for the common man, whereas the platform named Svarna or gold was a royal citadel. The platforms were connected to each other by tall bridges made of stones and baked bricks which rose above the flood plains below. Along the periphery of each enormous platform were towering city walls with giant spikes facing outwards. There were turrets at regular intervals along the city walls from where approaching enemies could be repelled. This spectacle was beyond anything that Shiva had ever seen. In his mind, the construction of a city like this must truly be man's greatest achievement. Shiva's entourage rode up to the drawbridge across the field of spikes to the Tamra platform. The drawbridge had been reinforced with metal bars at the bottom and had roughened baked bricks laid out on top so that horses and chariots would not slip. There was something about the bricks 
he had seen across the empire that had intrigued Shiva. Turning to Nandi, he asked, Are these bricks made as per some standard process? Yes, my lord, replied a surprised Nandi. All the bricks in Meluha are made as per specifications and guidelines given by the chief architect of the empire. But how did you guess? They are all exactly the same dimension. Nandi beamed in pride at his empire's efficiency and his lord's power of observation. The platform rose at the end of the drawbridge, with a road spiralling up to the summit in one gentle turn, facilitating the passage of horses and chariots. In addition, there was a broad flight of stairs leading straight up the incline for pedestrians. The city walls and the platform extended steeply onto the sides around this slope, making it a valley of death for any enemy foolish enough to attack the platform from this area. The city gates were made of a metal that Shiva had never seen before. Nandi clarified that they were made of iron, a new metal that had just been discovered. It was the strongest of all the metals, but very expensive. The ore required to make it was not easily available. At the platform entry, on top of the city gates, was etched the symbol of the Suryavanshis, a bright red circular sun with its rays blazing out in all directions. Below it was the motto that they lived by. Satya, Dharma, Maan, Truth, Duty, Honor. Seeing just this much of the city had left Shiva awestruck. However, the sight that he witnessed at the top of the platform within the city gates was truly breathtaking both in its efficiency and simplicity. The city was divided into a grid of square blocks by the paved streets. There were footpaths on the side for pedestrians, lanes marked in the street for traffic in different directions, and of course there were covered drains running through the centre. All the buildings were constructed as standard two-storied block structures made of baked bricks. On top were wooden extensions for increasing the height of the building if required. Nandi clarified to Shiva that the structure of the buildings differed internally depending on their specific requirements. All windows and doors were built strictly on the side wall of buildings, never facing the main road. The blank walls that faced the main roads bore striking black line drawings depicting the different legends of the Suryavanshis, while the background was painted in the sober colours of grey, light blue, light green or white. The most common background colour though appeared to be blue. In the Meluhan mind, blue was the holiest colour of them all. It was the colour of the sky. It was just above green, the colour of the earth, in the colour spectrum. Meluhans, who liked to see some greater design in every act of nature, thought it was marvellous that blue was above green in the colour spectrum, just as the sky was above the earth. The most recurring illustrations on the walls were about the great emperor, Lord Ram his victories over his enemies, his subjugation of the wicked Chandravanshis, incidents that proved his statesmanship and wisdom had been lovingly recreated. Lord Ram was deeply revered and many Miluhans had come to worship him like a god. They referred to him as Vishnu, an ancient title for the greatest of the gods meaning protector of the world and propagator of good. As Shiva learned from Nandi, the city was divided into many districts consisting of four to eight blocks. Each district had its own markets, commercial and residential areas, temples and entertainment centres. Manufacturing or any other polluting activity was conducted in separate quarters away from the districts. The efficiency and smoothness with which Devagiri functioned belied the fact that it was the most populous city in the entire empire. The last census just two years back had pegged the population of the city at 200,000. Nandi led Shiva and the three soldiers to one of the city's numerous guest houses, built for the many tourists that frequented Devagiri for both business and leisure. Tying up their horses in the designated area outside the guest house, the party walked in to register themselves and check into their rooms. The guest house had a style similar to the many that Shiva had seen throughout their journey. There was a central courtyard with the building built around it. The rooms were comfortably furnished and spacious. My lord, it's almost time for dinner, said Nandi. I will speak to the housekeeper and have some food arranged. We should eat early and get enough sleep since our appointment with the emperor has been fixed at the beginning of the second prahar tomorrow. Sounds like a good idea. Also, if it's all right with you, shall I dismiss the soldiers and send them back to Srinagar? That also sounds like a good idea, said a smiling Shiva. Why, Nandi, you're almost like a fount of brilliant ideas.
Nandi laughed along with Shiva, always happy to be the cause of a smile on his lord's face. I'll just be back, my lord. Shiva lay down on his bed and was quickly lost in the thoughts that really mattered to him. I'll finish the meeting with the emperor as soon as humanly possible, give him whatever the bloody hell he wants, and then scour the city for Sati. Shiva had considered asking Nandi about the whereabouts of Sati, but had eventually decided against it. He was painfully aware that he had made a less than spectacular impression on her at their first meeting. If she hadn't made it easy for him to find her, it only meant that she wasn't terribly stirred by him. He didn't want to compound the issue by speaking casually about her to others. He smiled as the memory of her face came flooding back to him. He replayed the magical moments when he had seen her fighting. Not the most romantic of sights for most men of his tribe, but for Shiva it was divine. He sighed, recalling her soft, delicate body, which had suddenly developed brutal, killer qualities upon being attacked. The curves that had so captivated him swung smoothly as she transferred her weight to swing her sword. The sober, tied hair had swayed sensuously with each move of the sword arm. He breathed deeply. What a woman! It was early in the morning when Shiva and Nandi crossed the bridge between the Tamra and Svarna platform to reach the royal citadel. The bridge, another marvel of Meluhan engineering, was flanked on the sides by a thick wall. Holes had been drilled on the walls to shoot arrows or pour hot oil on enemies. The bridge was bisected by a massive gate, a final protection just in case the other platform was lost to an enemy. When they crossed over to the Svarna platform, Shiva was completely taken by surprise, not by the grandeur of the royal area, but by the lack of it. He was shocked by the fact that there was no opulence. Despite ruling over such a massive and wealthy empire, the nobility lived in a conspicuously simple manner. The structure of the royal citadel was almost exactly like the other platforms. There were no special concessions for the aristocrats. The same block structures that dominated all of Meluha were to be found in the royal citadel as well. The only magnificent structure was to the far right and sported the sign Great Public Bath. The bath also had a glorious temple to Lord Indra to the left. The temple, built of wood, stood on a raised foundation of baked bricks, its cupola plated with solid gold. It seemed that special architecture was reserved only for structures built for the gods or ones that were for the common good. Probably just like how Lord Ram would have preferred. The only concession to the emperor, however, was that his standard block structure was larger than the others, significantly larger. Shiva and Nandi entered the royal private office to find Emperor Daksha sitting on a simple throne at the far end of the modestly furnished room, flanked by a man and a woman. Daksha, greeting Shiva with a formal namaste, said, I hope your journey was comfortable. He looked too young to be an emperor of such a large country. Though he was marginally shorter than Shiva, the major difference between them was the musculature. While the strapping Shiva was powerfully built, Daksha's body showed that it had not been strained by too much exercise. He wasn't obese either, just average. The same could have been said about his wheatish complexioned face. Average size, dark eyes, flanked a straight nose. He wore his hair long like most Meluhan men and women. The head bore a majestic crown with the sun symbol of the Surya Vanshis manifested in the center through sparkling gemstones. An elegant dhoti with an angvastram hung down the right shoulder and a large amount of functional jewelry, including two amulets on his right arm, complemented Daksha's average appearance. His only distinguishing feature was his smile, which spread its innocent conviction all the way to his eyes. Emperor Daksh looked like a man who wore his royalty lightly. Yes, it was, Your Highness, replied Shiva. The infrastructure in your empire is wonderful. You are an extraordinary emperor. Thank you. But I only deserve reflected credit. The work is done by my people. You are too modest, Your Highness. Smiling politely, Daksha asked, May I introduce my most important aides? Without waiting for an answer, he pointed to the woman on his left. This is my Prime Minister, Kanakhala. She takes care of all administrative, revenue and protocol matters. Kanakhala did a formal namaste to Shiva. Her head was shaved except for a tuft of smooth hair at the back which had been tied in a knot. She had a string called the Janeu 
tied across her left shoulder down to the right side of her torso. She looked young, like most Maluhans, but was a little overweight, as was clearly evident from the excess flesh she bore between the white blouse and Thoti. She had a dark and incredibly smooth complexion, and, like all her countrymen, wore jewellery that was restrained and conservative. Shiva noticed that the second amulet on Kanakala's arm showed a pigeon, not a very high chosen tribe amongst the Brahmin. Shiva bent low and did a formal namaste in reply. Pointing to his right, Daksha said, And this is my chief of the armed forces, General Parvateshwar. He looks after the army, navy, special forces, police, etc. Parvateshwar looked like a man that Shiva would think twice about taking on in battle. He was taller than Shiva and had an immensely muscular physique that dominated the space around him. His curly and long hair had been combed fastidiously and fell neatly from under his crown. His smooth, swarthy skin was marked by the proud signs of long years in battle. His body was hairless in a rare departure from the normally hirsute Kshatriya men who took body hair to be a sign of machismo. Probably to make up for this deficiency, Parvateshwar maintained a thick and long moustache which curled upwards at the edges. His eyes reflected his uncompromisingly strong and righteous character. The second amulet on his arm showed Parvateshwar as a tiger, a very high chosen tribe amongst the Kshatriyas. He nodded curtly at Shiva. No namaste. No elaborate bow of his proud head. Shiva, however, smiled warmly and greeted Parvateshwar with a formal namaste. Please wait outside, Captain, advised Parvateshwar, looking at Nandi. Before Nandi could respond, Shiva cut in. My apologies, but is it all right if Nandi stays here with me? He has been my constant companion since I left my homeland and has become a dear and trusted friend. Of course he may, replied Daksha. Your Highness, it is not appropriate for a captain to be witness to this discussion, said Parvateshwar. In any case, his service rules clearly state that he can only escort a guest into the Emperor's presence and not stay there while a matter of state is discussed. Oh, relax, Parvateshwar. You take your service rules too seriously sometimes. Turning to Shiva, Daksha continued, If it's all right with you, may we see your neck now? Nandi slid behind Shiva to untie the cravat. Seeing the beads down on the cravat to convey the impression that throat was covered for religious reasons, Daksha smiled and whispered, Good idea. As Nandi pulled Shiva's cravat off, Daksha and Kanakhala came close to inspect Shiva's throat in greater detail. Parvateshwar did not step forward, but strained his neck slightly to get a better look. Daksha and Kanakhala seemed clearly stunned by what they saw. The emperor felt the throat and whispered in awe, The color comes from the inside. It is not a dye. It is true and genuine. Daksha and Kanakhala glanced at each other, tears glistening in their astounded eyes. Kanakhala folded her hands into a namaste and began mumbling a chant under her breath. Daksha looked up at Shiva's face, trying desperately to suppress the ecstasy that coursed through his insides. With a controlled smile, the Emperor of Miluha said, I hope we have not done anything to cause you any discomfort since your arrival in Miluha. Despite Daksha's controlled reaction, Shiva could guess that both the Emperor and his Prime Minister were taken aback by his blue throat. Just how important is this bloody blue throat for the Maluhans? Um, none at all, Your Highness, replied Shiva as he tied the cravat back around his neck. In fact, my tribe and I have been delighted by the hospitality that we have received here. I'm glad for that, smiled Daksha, bowing his head politely. You may want to rest a little bit, and we could talk in more detail tomorrow. Would you like to shift your residence to the Royal Citadel? It is rumoured that the quarters here are a little more comfortable. That is a very kind offer, Your Highness. Daksha turned to Nandi and asked, Captain, what did you say your name was? My name is Nandi, Your Highness. You too are welcome to stay here. Make sure that you take good care of our honoured guest. Kanakhla, please make all the arrangements. Yes, Your Highness. Kanakhla called in one of her aides, who escorted Shiva and Nandi out of the royal office. As Shiva exited the room, Daksha went down on his haunches with great ceremony and touched his head to the ground on which Shiva had just stood. He mumbled a prayer softly and stood up again to look at Kanakhla with tears in his eyes. Kanakhla's eyes, however, betrayed impatience and a touch of anger. 
I didn't understand, Your Highness, glared Kanakla. The blue mark was genuine. Why did you not tell him? What did you expect me to do? cried a surprised Daksha. This is his second day in Devagiri. You want me to just accost him and tell him that he is the Nilkant, our saviour? That he has been sent to solve all our problems? Well, if he has a blue throat, then he is the Nilkant, isn't he? And if he is the Nilkant, then he is our saviour. He has to accept his destiny. An exasperated Parvateshwar interjected, I can't believe that we are talking like this. We are Meluhans. We are the Surya Vanshis. We have created the greatest civilization ever known to man, and some barbarian with no education, no skills, no merit is going to be our saviour? Just because he has a blue throat? That is what the legend says, Parvateshwar, countered Kanakhla. Daksha interrupted both his ministers. Parvateshwar, I believe in the legend. My people believe in the legend. The Nilkant has chosen my reign to appear. He will transform all of India to the ideals of Meluha, a land of truth, duty and honour. With his leadership, we can end the Chandravanshi crisis once and for all. All the agonies they inflict upon us will be over, from the terrorist attacks to the shortage of Somras to the killing of the Saraswati. Then why delay telling him, Your Highness? asked Kanakla. The more days we waste, the weaker becomes the resolve of our people. You know there was another terrorist attack just a few days back at a village not far from Hariopa. As our reaction becomes weak, our enemies become bolder, Your Highness. We must tell the Lord quickly and announce His arrival to our people. It will give us the strength to fight our cruel enemies. I will tell him, but I am trying to be more far-sighted than you. So far our empire has only faced the morale-sapping influence of fraudulent Nilkants. Imagine the consequences if people found out that the true Nilkant has come but refuses to stand by us. First, we must be sure that he is willing to accept his destiny. Only then will we announce him to our people. And I think that the best way to convince him is to share the whole truth with him. Once he sees the unfairness of the attacks we face, he will fight with us to destroy evil. If that takes time, so be it. We have waited for centuries for the Nilkant. A few more weeks will not destroy us. Chapter 5 Tribe of Brahma Shiva was walking in the verdant gardens of the royal guest house. His things were being moved into the royal guest house by Nandi and Kanakla's efficient aid. Shiva sat down on a comfortable bench overlooking a bed of red and white roses. The charming cool breeze in the open gardens brought a smile to his face. It was early afternoon and the garden was deserted. Shiva's thoughts kept going back to the conversation he had had with the emperor in the morning. Despite Daksha's controlled reaction, Shiva could understand that his blue throat was of great significance to the Meluhans, even to the emperor. It meant that the legend of the Nilkant, whatever it was, was not restricted to some small sect in Kashmir. If the emperor himself took it so seriously, all of Meluha must need the help of the Nilkant. But what the bloody hell do they want help for? They are so much more advanced than us. His thoughts were distracted by the sounds of a dhol, a percussion instrument and some ghungrus, anklets worn by dancers. Someone seemed to be practicing in the garden. A hedge separated the dance pavilion from the rest of the garden. Shiva, himself a passionate dancer, would normally have stepped in to move to the rhythm of the beat. But his mind was too preoccupied. Some words floated in from the group that was dancing. No, my lady, you must let yourself go, said a distinguished male voice. It is not a chore that you have to do. Enjoy the dance. You are trying too hard to remember all the steps rather than letting the emotion of the dance flow through you. Then a lady's voice interjected. My lady, Guruji is right. You are dancing correctly, but not enjoying it. The concentration shows on your face. You have to relax a little bit. Let me get the steps right first, then I can learn to enjoy them. The last voice made Shiva's hair stand up on end. It was her. It was Sati. He quickly got up and followed the sound of the voices. Coming up from behind the hedge, he saw Sati dancing on a small platform. She had her hands raised rigidly to her sides as she enacted the various movements of the dance. She danced in accordance with the steps first to the left and then to the right. She moved her shapely hips to the side and placed her hands precisely on her waist 
to convey the mood of the dance. He was mesmerized once again. However, he did notice that though Sati was dancing all her steps correctly, the Guruji was right. She was moving in a mechanical manner. The uninhibited surrender that is characteristic of a natural dancer was absent. The varying emotions of bliss and anger of the story being told were missing in her moves. And unlike a proficient dancer, Sati wasn't using the entire platform. Her steps were small, which kept her movements constricted to the center. The dance teacher sat facing her and playing on a dhol to give Sati her beats. Her companion Kritika sat to the right. It was the dance teacher who noticed Shiva first and immediately stood up. Sati and Kritika turned around as well and were clearly astonished to find Shiva standing in front of them. Unlike Sati, Kritika could not control her surprise and blurted out, Shiva? Sati, in a characteristic, composed and restrained manner, asked sincerely, Is everything all right, Shiva? Do you need my help for something? How have you been? I've missed you. Don't you ever smile? Shiva continued to stare at Sati, the words running through his mind, not on his lips. A smiling Kritika looked at Sati for her reaction. An even more serious Sati repeated, very politely, Can I help you with something, Shiva? No, no, I don't need any help, replied Shiva, as reality seemed to enter his consciousness once again. I just happened to be in the area and heard your dancing. I mean, your talk. Your dance steps were not so hard that I could hear it. You were dancing very accurately. Actually, technically, it was all... Kritika interjected. You know a bit about dancing, do you? Oh, not much, just a little, said Shiva to Kritika with a smile, before turning rapidly back to Sati. My apologies, Sati. But Guruji is right. You were being far too methodical. As they say in the land that I come from, the mudras and the kriyas were all technically correct, but the bhav or emotion was missing. And a dance without bhav is like a body without a soul. When the emotions of the dancer participate, she would not even need to remember the steps. The steps come on their own. The bhav is something that you cannot learn. It comes to you if you can create the space in your heart for it. Sati listened patiently to Shiva without saying a word. Her eyebrows were raised slightly as the barbarian spoke. How could he know more than a Surya Vanshi about dancing? But she reminded herself that he had saved her life. She was duty-bound to honor him. Kritika, however, took offense at this caste unmarked foreigner, pretending that he knew more about dancing than her mistress. She glowered at Shiva. You dare to think that you know more than one of the best dancers in the realm? Shiva gathered that he may have caused some offence. He turned to Sati in all seriousness. I am terribly sorry. I didn't mean to insult you in any way. Sometimes I just keep talking without realising what I am saying. No, no, replied Sati. You did not insult me. Perhaps you are right. I don't feel the essence of the dance as much as I should. But I am sure that with Guruji's guidance, I will pick it up in due time. Seizing his chance to impress Sati, Shiva said, If it is all right with you, may I perform the dance? I am sure that I am not as technically correct as you, but perhaps there may be something in the sentiment that will guide me through the correct steps. That was well put. She can't say no. Sati looked surprised. This was unexpected. Um, okay, she managed to say. A delighted Shiva immediately moved to the centre of the stage. He took off the angvastram covering his upper body and tossed it aside. Kritika's quick anger at the perceived insult to her mistress was forgotten quickly as she sighed at Shiva's rippling physique. Sati, though, began to wonder how Shiva would bend such a muscular body into the contortions that were required for this style of dancing. Flexibility was usually sacrificed by a human body at the altar of strength. Playing lightly on his dole, the Guruji asked Shiva, Tell me the beat that you are comfortable with, young man. Shiva folded his hands into a namaste, bent low and said, Guruji, could you just give me a minute, please? I need to prepare for the dance. Dancing was something Shiva knew as well as warfare. Facing east, he closed his eyes and bowed his head slightly. Then he bent down on his knees and reverentially touched the ground with his head. Standing up, he turned his right foot outwards. Then he raised his left leg off the floor in a graceful arcing movement till the foot was above knee height, as he bent his right knee slightly to balance himself. 
His left foot pointed in a direction exactly between the bearing of his right foot and his face. Only a calm breeze broke the almost deathly silence that enveloped the audience. The Guruji, Sati and Kritika looked in amazement at Shiva. They did not understand what he was doing, but could feel the energy that Shiva's stance was emanating. Shiva raised both his arms in an elegant circular movement to the sides to bring them in line with his shoulder. His right hand was molded into a position like it was holding an imaginary damru, a small handheld percussion instrument. His left hand was open with its palm facing upwards, almost like it was receiving some divine energy. He held this pose for some time. As his glowing face showed that Shiva was withdrawing into his own world, then his right hand moved effortlessly forward, almost as if it had a mind of its own. Its palm was now open and facing the audience. Somehow, the posture seemed to convey a feeling of protection to a very surprised Sati. His left arm then moved slowly from its shoulder height position to come in front of him with the palm facing down. The left arm stopped moving when the hand was pointing almost directly at the left foot. Shiva held this pose for some time. And then began the dance. Sati stared in wonder at Shiva. He was performing the same steps as her, yet it looked like a completely different dance. His hands moved effortlessly as his body moved almost magically. How could a body this muscular also be flexible? The Guruji tried helplessly to get his dhol to give Shiva the beats, but clearly that wasn't necessary, for it was Shiva's feet which were leading the beat for the dhol. The dance conveyed the various emotions of a woman. At the beginning, it conveyed her feelings of joy and lust as she cavorted with her husband. Then it conveyed her fury and pain on the wrongful death of her mate. Even with Shiva's rough masculine body, he managed to convey the tender yet strong emotions of a grieving woman. Shiva's eyes were open, but the audience realized that he was oblivious to them. Shiva was in his own world. He did not dance for the audience. He did not dance for appreciation. He did not dance for the music. He danced only for himself. Rather, it almost seemed like his dance was guided by a celestial force. Sati realized that Shiva was right. He had opened himself and the dance had come to him. After what seemed like an eternity, the dance came to an end, with Shiva firmly shutting his eyes. He held the final pose for a long time as the glow slowly left him. It was almost like he was returning to this world. Shiva gradually opened his eyes to find Sati, Kritika and the Guruji gaping at him in complete awe. The Guruji was the first to find his voice. Who are you? I am Shiva. No, no, not the body. I mean, who are you? Shiva crooked his eyes together in a frown and repeated, I am Shiva. Guruji, may I ask a question? asked Sati. Of course you may. Turning to Shiva, Sati asked, what was that you did before the dance? Was it some kind of preparatory step? Yes, it's called the Natraj pose, the pose of the Lord of Dance. The Natraj pose, what does it do? It aligned my energy to the universal energy so that the dance emerges on its own. I don't understand. Well, it's like this. Amongst our people, we believe that everything in the world is a carrier of Shakti or energy. The plants, animals, objects, our bodies, everything carries and transmits energy. But the biggest carrier of energy that we are physically in touch with is Mother Earth herself, the ground that we walk on. What does that have to do with your dance? For anything that you do, you need energy. You have to source the energy around you. The energy comes from people, from objects, from Mother Earth herself. You have to ask for that energy respectfully. And your Natraj pose helps you access any energy that you want? asked the Guruji. It depends on what I want the energy for. The Natraj pose helps me ask respectfully for energy for a dance that wants to come to me. If I wanted the energy for a thought to come to me, I would have to sit cross-legged and meditate. It seems that the energy favors you, young man, said the Guruji. You are the Natraj, the Lord of Dance. Oh no, exclaimed Shiva. I am just the medium of the boundless Natraj energy. Anyone can be the medium. Well then, you are a particularly efficient medium, young man, said the Guruji. 
Turning to Sati, he said, You don't need me if you have a friend like him, my child. If you want to be taught by Shiva, it would be my honor to excuse myself. Shiva looked at Sati expectantly. This had gone much better than he had expected. Say yes, damn it! Sati, however, seemed to withdraw into herself. Shiva was startled to see the first signs of vulnerability in this woman. She bowed her head, an act which did not suit her proud bearing, and whispered softly, I mean no disrespect to anyone, but perhaps I do not have the skills to receive training of this level. But you do have the skill, argued Shiva. You have the bearing, you have the heart, you can very easily reach that level. Sati looked up at Shiva, her eyes showing just the slightest hint of dampness. The profound sadness they conveyed took Shiva aback. What the hell is going on? I am very far from any level, Shiva, mumbled Sati. As she said that, Sati found the strength to control herself again. The politely proud manner returned to her face. The mask was back. It is time for my puja. With your permission, Guruji, I must leave. She turned towards Shiva. It was a pleasure meeting you again, Shiva. Before Shiva could respond, Sati turned quickly and left, followed by Kritika. The Guruji continued to stare at a flummox Shiva. At length, he bent low with a formal namaste towards Shiva and said, It has been my life's honor to see you dance. Then he too turned and left. Shiva was left wondering at the inscrutable ways of the Meluhans. It was late in the morning the next day when Shiva and Nandi entered the private royal office to find Daksha, Parvateshwar and Kanakhla waiting for him. A surprise, Shiva said. I am sorry, Your Highness. I thought we were to meet four hours into the second prahar. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. Daksha, who had stood up with a formal namaste, bowed low and said, No, my lord, you don't need to apologize. We came in early so that we wouldn't keep you waiting. It was our honor to wait for you. Parvateshwar rolled his eyes at the extreme subservience that his emperor, the ruler of the greatest civilization ever established, showed towards this barbarian. Shiva, controlling his extreme surprise at being referred to as the Lord by the Emperor, bowed low towards Daksha with a namaste and sat down. My Lord, before I start off my monologue about the legend of the Nilkant, do you have any questions that you would like to ask? inquired Daksha. The most obvious question came to Shiva's mind first. Why in the holy lake's name is my blessed blue throat so important? But his instincts told him, that though this appeared to be the most obvious question, it could not be answered unless he understood more about the society of Meluha itself. It may sound like an unusual question, Your Highness, said Shiva, but may I ask what your age is? Taksha looked in surprise at Kanakla. Then turning back towards Shiva with an awed smile, he said, You are exceptionally intelligent, my lord. You have asked the most pertinent question first. Crinkling his face into a conspiratorial grin, Daksha continued, Last month, I turned 184. Shiva was stunned. Daksha did not look a day older than 30. In fact, nobody in Meluha looked old, except for the pundit that Shiva had met at the Brahma temple. So Nandi is more than a hundred years old. How can this be, Your Highness? asked a flabbergasted Shiva. What sorcery makes this possible? There is no sorcery at all, my lord explained Daksha. What makes this possible is the brilliance of our scientists who make a potion called the Somras, the drink of the gods. Taking the Somras at defined times not only postpones our death considerably, but it also allows us to live our entire lives as if we are in the prime of our youth, mentally and physically. But what is the Somras? Where does it come from? Who invented it? So many questions, my lord, smiled Daksha but I will try my best to answer them one by one. The Somras was invented many thousands of years ago by one of the greatest Indian scientists that ever lived. His name was Lord Brahma. I think there is a temple dedicated to him that I visited on the way to Devagiri at a place named Meru. Yes, my lord. That is where he is said to have lived and worked. Lord Brahma was a prolific inventor, but he never took any of the benefits of his inventions for himself. He was always interested in ensuring that his inventions were used for the good of mankind. He realized early on that a potion as powerful as a Somras could be misused by evil men. So he implemented an elaborate system of controls on its use. What kind of controls? He did not give the Somras freely to everyone, continued Daksha. 
After conducting a rigorous countrywide survey, he chose a select group of adolescent boys of impeccable character, one from each of the seven regions of ancient India. He chose young boys so that they would live with him at his Gurukul and he could mold their character into selfless helpers of society. The Somras medicine was administered only on these boys. Since these boys were practically given an additional life due to the Somras, they came to be known as the Dvija or twice born. With the strength of the Somras, the training of Lord Brahma and the numerous other inventions that they collectively produced, this group became more powerful than anyone in history. They honed their minds to achieve almost superhuman intelligence. The ancient Indian title for men of knowledge was Rishi. Since Lord Brahma's chosen men were seven in number, they came to be known as a Saptarishi. And these Saptarishis used their skills for the good of society? Yes, my lord. Lord Brahma instituted strict rules of conduct for the Saptarishis. They were not allowed to rule or to practice any trade, essentially anything that would have caused them personal gain. They had to use their skills to do the task of priests, teachers, doctors, amongst other intellectual professions, where they could use their powers to help society. They were not allowed to charge anything for their services and had to live on alms and donations from others. Tough service rules, joked Shiva, with a slight wink at Parvateshwar. Parvateshwar did not respond, but Daksha, Kanakla and Nandi guffawed loudly. Shiva took a quick look at the Prahar lamp by the window. It was almost the third Prahar, the time that Sati would probably come out to dance. But they followed their code of conduct strictly, my lord, continued Daksha. Over time, as their responsibilities grew, the Saptarishi selected many more people to join their tribe. Their followers swore by the same code that the Saptarishis lived by and were also administered the Somras. They devoted their lives to the pursuit of knowledge and for the well-being of society without asking for any material gain in return. It is for this reason that society accorded these people almost devotional respect. Over the ages, the Saptarishis and their followers came to be known as the tribe of Brahma or simply the Brahmins. But as it usually happens with all good systems over long periods of time, some people stopped following the Brahmin code, right? Absolutely, my lord, answered Daksha, shaking his head at the all too familiar human frailty. As many millennia went by, some of the Brahmins forgot the strict code that Lord Brahma had enforced and the Saptarishis propagated. They started misusing the awesome powers that the Somras gave them for their own personal gains. Some Brahmins started using their influence over a large number of people to conquer kingdoms and start ruling. Some Brahmins misused other inventions of the Saptarishis and Lord Brahma to accumulate fabulous wealth for themselves. And some of the Brahmins interjected Kanakla with a particular sense of horror, even rebelled against the Saptarishi Uttradhikaris. Saptarishi Uttradhikaris? inquired Shiva. They were the successors to the Saptarishis, my lord, clarified Kanakla. When any of the Saptarishi knew that he was coming to the end of his mortal life, he would appoint a man from his Gurukul as his successor. This successor was treated for all practical purposes like the Saptarishi himself. So rebelling against the Saptarishi Uttradhikaris was like rebelling against the Saptarishi themselves. Yes, my lord, answered Kanakla. And the most worrying part of this corruption was that it was being led by the higher chosen tribe Brahmins like the eagles, peacocks and the swans. In fact, due to their higher status, these chosen tribes were actually not even allowed to work under the Kshatriyas and Vaishyas, lest they get enticed by the lure of the material world. Yet, they succumbed to the temptations of evil before anyone else. And chosen tribes like yours, the pigeons, Remain loyal to the old code, despite working for the Kshatriyas? asked Shiva. Yes, my lord, replied Kanakla, her chest puffed up with pride. The town bell, indicating the beginning of the third Prahar, sounded out loudly. All the people in the room, including Shiva, said a quick short prayer, welcoming the new time chapter. Shiva had learned some of the ways of the Maluhans. A Shudra came in, reset the Prahar lamp precisely, and left as quietly as he came. Shiva reminded himself that any time now, Sati would start her dance in the garden. So what revolution caused the change, Your Highness? asked Shiva, turning to Daksha. You, Parvateshwar and Nandi are Kshatriyas, and yet you clearly have taken the Somras. 
In fact, I have seen people of all four castes in your empire look youthful and healthy. This means that the Somras is now given to everybody. This change must have obviously happened due to a revolution, right? Yes, my lord. And the revolution was known as Lord Ram, the greatest emperor that ever lived, Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram repeated everyone in the room. His ideas and leadership transformed the society of Meluha dramatically, continued Daksha. In fact, the course of history itself was radically altered. But before I continue with Lord Ram's tale, may I make a suggestion? Of course, Your Highness. It is into the third Prahat now. Should we move to the dining room and partake of some lunch before continuing with this story? I think it's an excellent idea to have lunch, Your Highness, said Shiva. But may I be excused for some time? There is another pressing engagement that I have. Could we perhaps continue our conversation tomorrow if that's suitable to you? Kanakla's face fell immediately, while Parvateshwar's was covered with a contemptuous grin. Daksha, however, kept a smiling face. Of course we could meet tomorrow, my lord. Will the beginning of the second hour of the second Prahar be all right with you? Absolutely, Your Highness. My apologies for this inconvenience. Not at all, my lord, said an ever-smiling Daksha. Can one of my chariots take you to your destination? That's very kind of you, Your Highness, but I will go there myself. My apologies once again. Bidding a namaste to everyone in the room, Shiva and Nandi walked quickly out. Kanakra looked accusingly at Daksha. The emperor just nodded his head, gesturing with his hands for calm. It's all right. We're meeting tomorrow, aren't we? My lord, we are running out of time, said Kanakla. The Nilkant needs to accept his responsibilities immediately. Give him time, Kanakla. We have waited for so long. A few days is not going to cause a collapse. Parvateshwar got up suddenly, bowed low towards Daksha and said, With your permission, Your Highness, may I be excused? There are more practical things that need my attention compared to educating a barbarian. You will speak of him with respect, Parvateshwar, growled Kanakla. He is the Nilkant. I will speak of him with respect only when he has earned it through some real achievements, snarled Parvateshwar. I respect only achievements, nothing else. That is the fundamental rule of Lord Ram. Only your karma is important, not your birth, not your sex, and certainly not the color of your throat. Our entire society is based on merit. Or have you forgotten that? Enough, exclaimed Daksha. I respect the Nilkant. That means everybody will respect him. Chapter 6 Vikarma, The Carriers of Bad Fate Nandi waited at a distance in the garden, as he had been asked to do, while Shiva went behind the hedge to the dance area. The silent dance stage had already convinced Nandi that his lord would not find anybody there. However, Shiva was filled with hope and waited expectantly for Sadi. After having waited for the larger part of an hour, Shiva realized that there would be no dance practice today. Deeply disappointed, he walked silently back to Nandi. Is there somebody I can help you find, my lord? asked an earnest Nandi. No, Nandi, forget it. Trying to change the topic, Nandi said, My lord, you must be hungry. Should we go back to the guest house and eat? No, I'd like to see a little more of the city, said Shiva, hoping that fate would be kind to him and he would run into Sati in the town. Shall we go to one of the restaurants on the Rajat platform? That would be wonderful, smiled Nandi, who hated the simple Brahmin-influenced vegetarian food served at the royal guest house. He missed the spicy meats that were served in rough Kshatriya restaurants. Yes, what is it, Parvateshwar? asked Daksha. My lord, I am sorry for the sudden meeting, but I just received some disturbing news and had to tell you this in private. Well, what is it? Shiva is already causing trouble. What have you got against the Nilkant? groaned Daksha, raising his eyes in disapproval. Why can't you believe that the Nilkant has come to save us? This has nothing to do with my views on Shiva, my lord. If you will please listen to my news. Chinadhwaj saw Shiva in the gardens yesterday. Chinadhwaj is here already? Yes, your highness. His review with you has been fixed for the day after tomorrow. Anyway. So what did Chenardhwaj see? He is also sickeningly taken in by the Nilkant, so I think we can safely assume that he doesn't have any prejudice. All right, I believe you. So what did he see the Nilkant do? He saw Shiva dancing in the gardens, 
answered Parvateshwar. So, is there a law banning dance that I am not aware of? Please, let me continue, Your Highness. He was dancing while Sati watched in rapt attention. His interest suddenly captivated. Daksha leaned forward to ask, And? Sati behaved correctly and left the moment Shiva tried to get too familiar. But Janal Dwaj heard Shiva whisper something when Sati left. Well, what did he whisper? Holy Lake, help me get her. I will not ask for anything else from you ever again. Daksha appeared delighted. You mean the Nilkant may actually be in love with my daughter? Your Highness, you cannot forget the laws of the land, exclaimed a horrified Parvateshwar. You know that Sati cannot marry. If the Nilkant decided to marry Sati, no law on earth can stop him. My lord, forgive me, but the entire basis of our civilization is that nobody is above the law. That's what makes us who we are. Better than the Chandravanshis and the Nagas, not even Lord Ram was above the law. Then how can this barbarian be considered so important? Don't you want Sati to be happy? asked Daksha. She's also called Parvati for a reason. It's because she's your goddaughter. Don't you want her to find joy again? I love Sati like the daughter I never had, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar, with a rare display of emotions in his eyes. I would do anything for her, except break the law. That is the difference between you and me. For Sati's sake, I would not mind breaking any law. She is my daughter, my flesh and blood. She has suffered enough already. If I can find some way to make her happy, I will do it, no matter what the consequences. Shiva and Nandi tied their horses in the designated area next to the main Rajat platform market. Walking forward, Nandi guided Shiva towards one of his favorite restaurants. The inviting aroma of freshly cooked meat brought forth a long-lost hunger in Nandi that had not been satisfied in the past two days at the royal guest house. The owner, however, stopped Shiva at the entry. What's the matter, brother? asked Nandi. I am deeply sorry, brothers, but I too am undergoing religious vows at this time, said the restaurant owner politely, pointing to the beads around his throat. And you know that one of the vows is that I cannot serve meat to fellow religious vow keepers. Nandi blurted out in surprise, But who has taken religious... Oh. He was stopped by Shiva, who signaled downwards with his eyes at the bead-covered cravat around his throat. Nandi nodded and followed Shiva out of the restaurant. This is the time of the year for religious vows, my lord, explained Nandi. Why don't you wait on the side? There are some good restaurants on the lane at the right. I will just go and check if we have a restaurant owner who has not taken his vows. Shiva nodded his assent. As Nandi hurried off, Shiva looked around the street. It was a busy market area with restaurants and shops spread evenly. But despite the large number of people and the commerce being conducted, the street was not bursting with noise. None of the shopkeepers came out to scream and advertise their wares. The customers spoke softly and in an unfailingly polite manner, even if they were bargaining. These well-mannered idiots would not be able to get any business done in our boisterous mountain market. Shiva, lost in his thoughts about the strange practices of the Meluhans, did not hear the announcement of the town crier till he was almost right behind him. Procession of Vikarma women, please move! A surprised Shiva turned around to find a tall Meluhan Kshatriya looking down at him. Would you like to move aside, sir? A procession of Vikarma women needs to pass for their prayers. The crier's tone and demeanour was unquestionably courteous, but Shiva was under no illusions. The crier was not asking Shiva to move, he was telling him. Shiva stepped back to let the procession pass as Nandi touched him gently on his arm. I found a good restaurant, my lord, said an ecstatic Nandi, one of my favourites, and his kitchen is going to run for at least an hour more, a lot of food to stuff ourselves with. Shiva laughed out loud. It's a wonder that just one restaurant can actually make enough food to satisfy your hunger. <laughs> Nandi laughed long good-naturedly as Shiva patted his friend on the back. As he turned and walked into the lane, Shiva asked, Who are Vikarma women? Vikarma people, my lord, said Nandi, sighing deeply, are people who have been punished in this birth for the sins of their previous birth. Hence, they have to live this life out with dignity and tolerate their present sufferings with grace. 
This is the only way they can wipe their karma clean of the sins of their previous birth. Vikarma men have their own order of penance and women have a different order. There was a procession of Vikarma women on the road we just left. Is their puja a part of that order? asked Shiva. Yes, my lord. There are many rules that the Vikarma women have to follow. They have to pray for forgiveness every month to Lord Agni, the purifying fire god, through a specifically mandated puja. They are not allowed to marry since they may poison others with their bad fate. They are not allowed to touch any person who is not related to them or is not part of their normal duties. There are many other conditions as well that I am not completely aware of. If you are interested, we could meet up with a Pandit at the Agni temple later and he could tell you all about Vikarma people. No, I am not interested in meeting the Pandit right now, said Shiva with a smile. He might just bore me with some very confusing and abstruse philosophies. But tell me one thing. Who decides that the Vikarma people had committed sins in their previous birth? Their own karma, my lord, said Nandi, his eyes pointing at the obvious. For example, if a woman gives birth to a stillborn child, why would she be punished thus unless she had committed some terrible sin in her previous birth? Or if a man suddenly contracts an incurable disease and gets paralyzed, why would it happen to him unless the universe was penalizing him for the sins of his previous life? That sounds pretty ridiculous to me. A woman could have given birth to a stillborn child simply because she did not take proper care while she was pregnant. Or it could just be a disease. How can anyone say that she is being punished for the sins of her previous birth? Nandi, shocked by Shiva's opinion, struggled to find words to respond. He was a Maluhan and deeply believed in the concept of karma being carried over many births. He mumbled softly, It's the law, my lord. Well, to be honest, it sounds like a rather unfair law to me. Nandi's crestfallen face showed that he was profoundly disappointed that Shiva did not understand such a fundamental concept about Meluha. But he also kept his counsel for fear of opposing what Shiva had said. After all, Shiva was his lord. Seeing a dejected Nandi, Shiva patted him gently on the back. Nandi, that was just my opinion. If the law works for your people, I'm sure there must be some logic to it. Your society might be a little strange at times, but it has some of the most honest and decent people I have ever met. As a smile returned almost instantly to Nandi's face, his whole being was overcome by his immediate problem, his debilitating hunger. He entered the restaurant as a man on a mission, with Shiva chuckling softly behind. A short distance away on the main road, the procession of Vikarma women walked silently on. They were all draped in long angvastrams, which were dyed in the holy blue color. Their heads were bowed low in penitence, their puja thalis, or prayer plates, full of offerings to Lord Agni. The normally quiet market street became almost deathly silent as the pitiful women lumbered by. At the center of the procession, unseen by Shiva, with her head bowed low draped in a blue angavastram that covered her from head to toe. Her face, a picture of resigned dignity, trudged the forlorn figure of Sati. So, where were we, my lord? said Daksha as Shiva and Nandi settled down in his private office the next morning. We were about to discuss the changes that Lord Ram brought about, your highness, and how he defeated the rebellion of the renegade Brahmins, answered Shiva. That's right, said Daksha. Lord Ram did defeat the renegade Brahmins, but in his view, the core problem went deeper. It wasn't just an issue of some Brahmins who did not follow the code. The problem was a conflict between a person's natural karma and what society forced him to do. I didn't understand, Your Highness. If you think about it, what was the essential problem with the renegade Brahmins? Some of them wanted to be Kshatriyas and rule. Some of them wanted to be Vaishyas, make money and live a life of luxury. However, their birth confined them to being Brahmins. But I thought that Lord Brahma decreed that people became Brahmins through a competitive examination process, said Shiva. That is true, my lord. But over time, this process of selection lost its fairness. Children of Brahmins became Brahmins, children of Kshatriyas became Kshatriyas, and so on. The formal system of selection soon ceased to exist. A father would ensure that his children got all the resources and support needed to grow up and become a member of his own caste. So, the caste system became rigid. So, did that also mean that there could have been a person talented enough to be a Brahmin, but if he was born to Shudra parents, he would not get the opportunity to become a Brahmin? asked Shiva. 
Yes, Shiva, said Parvateshwar, speaking for the first time to Shiva. He noticed that Parvateshwar did not fawn over him and call him Lord. In Lord Ram's view, any society that conducted its transactions based on anything besides merit could not be stable. His view was that a person's caste should be decided only on that person's karma, not his birth, not his sex, no other reason should interfere. That is nice in theory, Parvateshwar, argued Shiva. But how do you ensure it in practice? If a child is born in a Brahmin family, he would get the upbringing and resources which would be different from that of a child born in a Shudra family. So this child would grow up to be a Brahmin even if he was less talented than the Shudra boy. Isn't this unfair to the child born in the Shudra family? Where is the merit in this system? That was the genius of Lord Ram, Shiva, smiled Parvateshwar. He was, of course, a brave general, a brilliant administrator and a fair judge. But his greatest legacy is a system he created to ensure that a person's karma is determined only by his abilities, nothing else. That system is what has made Meluha what it is, the greatest nation in history. You can't underestimate the role that Somras has played, Parvateshwar, said Daksha. Lord Ram's greatest act was to provide the Somras to everyone. The elixir is what makes Meluhans the smartest people in the universe. The Somras is what has given us the ability to create this remarkable and near-perfect society. Begging your pardon, Your Highness, said Shiva before turning back to Parvateshwar. But what was the system that Lord Ram set up? The system is simple, said Parvateshwar. As we agreed, the best society is when a person's caste is decided only by his abilities and karma, not by any other factor. Lord Ram created a practical system that ensured this. All children that are born in Meluha are compulsorily adopted by the empire. To ensure that this is done methodically, a great hospital city called Maika was built deep in the south, just north of the Narmada River. All pregnant women have to travel there for their delivery. Only pregnant women are allowed into the city, nobody else. Nobody else? What about her husband, her parents? asked Shiva. No, there are no exceptions to this rule except for one. This exception was voted in around 300 years ago. Husbands and parents of women of noble families were allowed to enter, answered Parvateshwar, his expression clearly showing that he violently disagreed with this corruption of Lord Ram's system. Then who takes care of the pregnant women in Maika? The hospital staff. They are well trained in this, continued Parvateshwar. Once the child is born, he or she is kept in Maika for a few weeks for health reasons, while the mother travels back to her own city. Without her child? asked a clearly surprised Shiva. Yes, replied Parvateshwar, with a slight frown, as if this was the most obvious fact in the world. The child is then put into the Meluha Gurukul, a massive school created by the empire close to Maika. Every single child receives the benefit of exactly the same education system. They grow up with all the resources of the empire available to them. Do they maintain records of the parents and the children? Of course they do. But the records are kept in utmost secrecy and only with the record keeper of Maika. That would mean that in the Gurukul or in the rest of the empire, nobody would know who the child's birth parents are, reasoned Shiva, as he worked out the implications of what he was hearing. So every child, whether born to a Brahmin or a Shudra, would get exactly the same treatment at the Gurukul. Yes, smiled Parvateshwar. He was clearly proud of the system. As the children enter the age of adolescence, they are all given the Somras. Thus every child has exactly the same opportunity to succeed. At the age of 15, when they have reached adulthood, all the children are given a comprehensive examination. The results of this examination decide which Varna or caste the child would be allocated to, Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya or Shudra. Kanakla cut in. And then the children are given one more year's caste-specific training. They wear their Varna color bands, white for Brahmins, red for Kshatriyas, green for Vaishyas and black for Shudras, and retreat to the respective caste schools to complete their education. So that's why your caste system is called the Varna system, said Shiva. Varna means color, right? Yes, my lord, smiled Kanakla. You are very observant. With a withering look at Kanakla, Parvateshwar added sarcastically, Yes, that was a very difficult conclusion to draw. Ignoring the barb, Shiva asked, So what happens after that? When the children turn 16, they are allocated to applicant parents from their caste, 
For example, if some Brahmin parents had applied to adopt a child, one randomly chosen student from Micah, who had won the Brahmin caste in the examination, will be allotted to them. Then the child grows up with these adopted parents as their own child. And society is perfect, marveled Shiva, as the simple brilliance of the system enveloped his mind. Each person is given a position in society based only on his own abilities. The efficiency and fairness of this system is astounding. Over time, my lord, interjected Daksha, we found that the percentage of higher castes actually going up in the population, which means that everybody in the world has the ability to excel. All it takes is for a child to be given a fair chance to succeed. Then the lower castes must have loved Lord Ram for this, asked Shiva. He gave them an actual chance to succeed. Yes, they did love him, answered Parvateshwar. They were his most loyal followers. Jai Shri Ram! But I guess not too many mothers would have been very happy with this. I can't imagine a woman willingly giving up her child as soon as he is born with no chance of meeting him ever again. But it's for the larger good, said Parvateshwar, scowling at the seemingly stupid question. And in any case, every mother who wants an offspring can apply for one and be allocated a child who suits her position and dreams. Nothing can be worse for a mother than having a child who does not measure up to her expectations. Shiva frowned at Parvateshwar's explanation, but let the argument pass. I can also imagine that many of the upper castes, like the Brahmins, would have been unhappy with Lord Ram. After all, they lost their stranglehold on power. Yes, added Daksha. Many upper castes did oppose Lord Ram's reforms, not just Brahmins, but even Kshatriyas and Vaishyas. Lord Ram fought a great battle to defeat them. Those of the vanquished who survived are the Chandravanshis we see today. So your differences go that far back? Yes, said Daksha. The Chandravanshis are corrupt and disgusting people. No morals, no ethics. They are the source of all our problems. Some of us believe that Lord Ram was too kind. He should have completely destroyed them. But he forgave them and let them live. In fact, we have to face the mortification of seeing the Chandravanshis rule over Lord Ram's birthplace, Ayodhya. Before Shiva could react to this information, the bell of the new Prahar was rung. Everyone said a quick prayer to welcome the subsequent time chapter. Shiva immediately looked towards the window. A look of expectancy appeared on his face. Daksha smiled as he observed Shiva's expression. We could break for lunch now, my lord. But if you have another engagement you would like to attend, we could continue tomorrow. Parvateshwar glared at Daksha disapprovingly. He knew exactly what the emperor was trying to do. That would be nice, your highness, smiled Shiva. Is my face that transparent? Yes, it is, my lord. But that is a gift you have. Nothing is prized more than honesty in Meluha. Why don't you leave for your engagement and we could convene here again tomorrow morning? Thanking Daksha profusely, Shiva left the room with Nandi in tow. Shiva approached the hedge with excitement and trepidation. The moment he heard the sound of the dole coming from the garden, he dispatched Nandi to have lunch at the guest house. He wanted to be alone. He let out a deep sigh of ecstasy as he crept behind the hedge to find Sati practicing under the watchful eye of the Guruji and Kritika. So good to see you again, Shiva, said the Guruji as he stood up with a formal namaste. The pleasure is all mine, Guruji, said Shiva as he bent down to touch the Guruji's feet as a sign of respect. Sati watched silently at a distance with her gaze on the floor. Kritika said enthusiastically, I just couldn't get your dance out of my mind. Shiva blushed at the compliment. Oh, it wasn't that good. Now you're fishing for compliments, teased Kritika. I was wondering if we could start off where we left last time, said Shiva, turning towards Sati. I don't think I have to be your teacher or anything like that. I just wanted to see you dance. Sati felt her strange discomfort returning again. What was it about Shiva that made her feel that she was breaking the law in speaking with him? She was allowed to talk to men as long as she kept a respectable distance. Why should she feel guilty? I will try my best, said Sati formally. It would be enriching to hear your views on how I can improve myself. I really do respect you for your dancing skills. Respect? Why respect? Why not love? Shiva smiled politely. Something inside told him that saying anything at this point of time would spoil the moment. Sati took a deep breath girded her Angavastram around her waist and committed herself to the Natraj pose. 
Shiva smiled as he felt Mother Earth project her Shakti, her energy into Sati. Energized by the earth she stood upon, Sati began her dance, and she really had improved. The emotion seemed to course through her. She was always good technically, but the passion elevated her dance to the next level. Shiva felt a dreamy sense of unreality overcome him again. Sati radiated a magnetic hold on him as she moved her lithe body into the dance steps. For some moments, Shiva imagined that he was the man that Sati was longing for in her dance. When she finally came to a stop, the audience spontaneously applauded. That was the best I have ever seen you dance, said the Guruji with pride. Thank you, Guruji, said Sati as she bowed. Then she looked expectantly at Shiva. It was fantastic, exclaimed Shiva. Absolutely fabulous. Didn't I tell you that you had it in you? I thought that I didn't get it exactly right at the attacking sequence, said Sati critically. You're being too hard on yourself, consoled Shiva. That was just a slight error. It happened only because you missed one angle on your elbow. That made your next move a little odd. Rising swiftly to his feet, Shiva continued. See, I'll show you. He walked quickly towards Sati and touched her elbow to move it to the correct angle. Sati immediately recoiled in horror as there was a gasp from the Guruji as well as Kritika. Shiva instantly realized that something terrible had happened. I am sorry, said Shiva, with a look of sincere regret. I was just trying to show you where your elbow should be. Sati continued to stare at Shiva, stunned into immobility. The Guruji was the first to recover his wits and realized that Shiva must undergo the purification ceremony. Go to your Pandit Shiva. Tell him you need a Shuddhikaran. Go before the day is over. What? What is a Shuddhikaran? Why would I need it? Please go for a Shuddhikaran, Shiva, said Sati, as tears broke through her proud eyes. If something happened to you, I would never be able to forgive myself. Nothing will happen to me. Look, I'm really sorry if I have broken some rule in touching you. I will not do it again. Let's not make a big deal out of this. It is a big deal, shouted Sati. The violence of Sati's reaction threw Shiva off balance. Why the hell is this simple thing being blown completely out of proportion? Kritika came close to Sati, careful not to touch her and whispered, We should go back home, my lady. No, no, please stay, pleaded Shiva. I won't touch you, I promise. With a look of hopeless despair, Sati turned to leave, followed by Kritika and Guruji. At the edge of the hedge, she turned around and beseeched Shiva once again, Please go for your Shuddhikaran before nightfall, please. At the look of uncomprehending mutiny on Shiva's face, the Guruji advised, Listen to her, Shiva. She speaks for your own good. What bloody nonsense! yelled Shiva, as his disturbed thoughts finally broke through his desperate efforts at silent acceptance. He was lying in his bedroom at the royal guest house. He had not undergone the Shuddhikaran. He had not even bothered to find out what the ceremony was. Why would I need to be purified for touching Sati? I want to spend all my remaining years touching her in every possible way. Am I going to keep on undergoing a Shuddhikaran every day? Bloody ridiculous! Just then, a troubling thought entered Shiva's mind. Is it because of me? Am I not allowed to touch her because I am cast unmarked, an inferior barbarian? No, that can't be true, whispered Shiva to himself. Sati doesn't think like that. She's a good woman, but what if it's true? Maybe if she knows I am the Nilkant. Chapter 7 Lord Ram's Unfinished Task You seem to be a little distracted this morning, my lord. Are you all right? asked a concerned Daksha. Hmm? said Shiva as he looked up. I am sorry, your highness, I was a little distracted. Daksha looked with a concerned expression at Kanakla. He had seen a similar look of despair on Sati's face at dinner the previous night, but she had refused to say anything. Do you want to meet later? asked Daksha. Of course not, Your Highness. It's all right. My apologies. Please continue, said Shiva. Well, continued a concerned Daksha, we were talking about the changes that Lord Ram brought about in society. Yes, said Shiva, shaking his head slightly to get the disturbing image of Sati's last plea out of his mind. The Mica system worked fantastically well. Our society boomed. Ours was always one of the wealthiest lands on earth. But in the last 1,200 years, we have shot dramatically ahead of everyone else. 
Meluha has become the richest and most powerful country in the world by far. Our citizens lead ideal lives. There is no crime. People do what they are suited for and not what an unfair social order would compel them to do. We don't force or fight unprovoked wars with any other country. In fact, ours has become a perfect society. Yes, Your Highness, agreed Shiva, slowly getting into the conversation. I don't believe that perfection can ever be achieved. It is more of a journey than a destination. But your society is certainly a near-perfect society. Why do you think we are not perfect? argued Parvateshwar aggressively. Do you think it's perfect, Parvateshwar? asked Shiva politely. Does everything in Meluha go exactly as Lord Ram would have mandated? Parvateshwar fell silent. He knew the obvious, even if he didn't like the answer. The Lord is right, Parvateshwar, said Daksha. There are always things to improve. Having said that, Your Highness, spoke Shiva, your society is wonderful. Things do seem very well ordered. What doesn't make sense to me then is why you and your people are so concerned about the future. What is the problem? Why is a Nilkant required? I don't see anything that is so obviously wrong that disaster would be just a breath away. This is not like my homeland, where there are so many problems that you wouldn't know where to begin. My lord, a Nilkant is needed because we are faced with challenges that we cannot confront. We keep to ourselves and let other countries lead their lives. We trade with other societies, but we never interfere with them. We don't allow uninvited foreigners into Meluha beyond the frontier towns. So we think it's only fair that other societies leave us alone to lead our lives the way we want to. And presumably they don't, Your Highness. No, they don't. Why? One simple word, my lord, replied Daksha. Jealousy. They hate our superior ways. Our efficient family system is an eyesore to them. The fact that we take care of everyone in our country makes them unhappy because they can't take care of themselves. They lead sorry lives. And rather than improving themselves, they want to pull us down to their level. I can understand. My tribe used to face a lot of jealousy in Mount Kailash since we had control over the shore of the Mansarova Lake and hence the best land in the region. But sometimes I wonder if we could have avoided bloodshed if we had shared our good fortune more willingly. But we do share our good fortune with those who wish it, my lord. And yet, jealousy blinds our enemies. The Chandravanshis realized that it was the Somras that guaranteed our superiority. Funnily enough, even they have the knowledge of the Somras, but they have not learned to mass-produce it like we do, and hence haven't reaped all the benefits of it. Sorry to interrupt, Your Highness, but where is the Somras produced? It is produced at a secret location called Mount Mandar. The Somras powder is manufactured there and then distributed throughout the empire. At designated temples across Meluha, trained Brahmins mix it with water and other ingredients to administer it to the population. All right, said Shiva. The Chandravanshis could not become as powerful as us since they never had enough Somras. Eaten up by their jealousy, they devised a devious way to destroy the Somras and hence us. One of the key ingredients in the Somras is the waters of the Saraswati. Water from any other source does not work. Really? Why? We don't know, my lord. The scientists can't explain it. But only the waters of the Saraswati will do. That is why the Chandravanshis tried to kill the Saraswati to harm us. Kill the river? asked Shiva incredulously. Yes, my lord, said Daksha as his childlike eyes flared up at the Chandravanshi perfidy. The Saraswati comes from the confluence of two mighty rivers up north, the Satlaj and the Yamuna. In the olden days, the course of the Satlaj and the Yamuna used to be neutral territory. Both the Chandravanshis and we visited the land to draw waters for the Somras. But how did they try to kill the Saraswati, Your Highness? They diverted the course of the Yamuna so that instead of flowing south, it started flowing east to meet their main river, Ganga. You can do that? asked Shiva in amazement. Change the course of a river? Yes, of course you can, answered Parvateshwar. We were livid, interjected Daksha, but we still gave them a chance to make amends for their duplicity. And? What can you expect from the Chandravanshis, my lord? said Daksha in disgust. They denied any knowledge of this. They claimed that the river made such a dramatic change in its course all by itself due to some minor earthquake. 
and even worse, they claimed that since the river had changed course of its own accord, we Maluhans would simply have to accept what was essentially God's will. We of course refused to do that, said Parvateshwar. Under the leadership of King Brahmanayak, His Highness's father, we attacked Swadweep. The land of the Chandravanshis, asked Shiva. Yes, Shiva, said Parvateshwar, and it was a resounding victory. The Chandravanshi army was routed. King Brahmanayak kindly let them keep their lands and even their system of governance. We didn't even ask for any war reparations or yearly tribute either. The only term of the surrender treaty was the return of the Yamuna. We restored the Yamuna to her original course to meet with the Saraswati. You fought in that war, Parvateshwar. Yes, said Parvateshwar, his chest swollen with pride. I was a mere soldier then, but I did fight in that war. Turning to Daksha, Shiva asked, Then what is the problem now, Your Highness? Your enemy was comprehensively defeated. Then why is the Saraswati still dying? We believe that the Chandravanshis are up to something again. We don't understand it as yet. After their defeat, the area between our two countries was made into a no-man's land and the jungle has reclaimed it. That included the early course of the Yamuna as well. We stuck to our part of the bargain and never disturbed that region. It appears that they didn't honour their end of the promise. Are you sure of that, Your Highness? Has the area been checked? Has this been discussed with the Chandravanshi representatives in your empire? Are you trying to say that we are lying? countered Parvateshwar. True Suryavanshis don't lie. Parvateshwar! scolded Daksha angrily. The Lord was not implying anything like that. Listen to me, Parvateshwar, said Shiva politely. If I have learnt something from the pointless battles of my land, it is that wars should be the last resort. If there is another solution possible, there is no harm in saving some young soldier's life. A mother somewhere would bless us for it. Let's not fight! Wonderful! What a great saviour we have! Parvateshwar muttered under his breath. You have something to say, Parvateshwar? barked Kanakla. I have told you before, you will not insult the Nilkant in my presence. I don't take orders from you, growled Parvateshwar. Enough! ordered Daksha. Turning to Shiva, he continued, I am sorry, my lord. You are right. We shouldn't just declare war without being sure. That is why I have avoided a war till now. But look at the facts of the case. The flow of the Saraswati has been slowly depleting for the last fifty years. And the last few years have been horrible, said Kanakla, as she controlled her tears at the slow death of the river most Maluhans regarded as a mother. The Saraswati doesn't even reach the sea now, and ends in an inland delta just south of Rajasthan. And the Somras cannot be made without water from the Saraswati, continued Daksha. The Chandravanshis know that, and that is why they are trying to kill her. What does the Swadweep representative say about it? Has he been questioned? We have no diplomatic relations with Swadweep, my lord, said Daksha. Really? I thought having representatives of other countries was one of your innovative systems. It gives you an opportunity to better understand them and maybe avoid jumping into a war. I had heard of a diplomatic mission from Mesopotamia coming in two days ago. Then why not have this with Swadweep as well? You don't know them, my lord. They are untrustworthy people. No follower of the Suravanshi way will dirty his soul by even speaking to a Chandravanshi willingly. Shiva frowned, but didn't say anything. You don't know the levels they have sunk to, my lord. Over the previous few years, they have even started using the cursed Nagas in their terrorist attacks on us, said Kanakla with a disgusted look. Terrorist attacks? Yes, my lord, said Daksha. Their defeat kept them quiet for many decades. And because of our overwhelming victory in the previous war, they believe that they cannot overpower us in an open confrontation. So they have resorted to a form of assault that only repulsive people like them could turn to. Terrorist attacks. I didn't understand. What exactly do they do? They send a small band of assassins who launch surprise attacks on non-military but public places. Their idea is to attack non-combatants, the Brahmins, Vaishyas or Shudras. They try to devastate places like temples, public baths, areas where there may not be soldiers to fight back, but whose destruction will wreck the empire's morale and spread terror. That's disgusting! Even the Pakritis in my land, a bunch of complete barbarians would not do that, said Shiva. Yes, said Parvateshwar, these Chandravanshis don't fight like men, they fight like cowards. 
then why don't you attack their country? Finish this once and for all. We would like to, my lord, said Daksha, but I'm not sure we can defeat them. Shiva observed Parvateshwar seething silently at the insult to his army, before turning towards Daksha. Why, your highness? You have a well-trained and efficient force. I'm sure your army can defeat them. Two reasons, my lord. Firstly, we are outnumbered. We were outnumbered even a hundred years back, but not by a very significant margin. But today, we estimate that they have a population of more than 80 million compared to our 8 million. They can throw a much larger army at us. Their sheer numbers will cancel out our technological superiority. But why should your population be less? You have people who live beyond the age of 200 years. Your population should be higher. Sociological causes, my lord, said Daksha. Our country is rich. Children are a matter of choice, more than a duty. Parents would adopt children from the mica system in small numbers, maybe one or two, so that they could devote more attention on their upbringing. Fewer and fewer mothers are giving birth at mica as well. In Swadweep, for the poor, children are bonded labor to supplement a family's income. The more children they have, the less poor the family. So that country as a whole has a far larger population. And the second reason for avoiding war? The second reason is something that is under our control. We fight with rules of war, with norms and ethics. The Chandravanshis do nothing like that. And I fear that this is a weakness in us that our ruthless enemies can exploit. Rules of war? asked Shiva. Yes. For example, we will not attack an unarmed man. A superior armed person like a cavalryman will not attack an inferior armed person like a spear-wielding foot soldier. A swordsman will never attack a person below his waist because that is unethical. The Chandravanshis don't care for such niceties. They will attack whomsoever and however they find expedient to ensure victory. Begging your pardon, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar, but that difference is what makes us who we are. Like Lord Ram said, a person's ethics and character are not tested in good times. It is only in bad times that a person shows how steadfast he is to his dharma. But, Parvateshwar, sighed Daksha, we are not under attack by people who are as ethical and decent as us. Our way of life is under assault. If we don't fight back in any which way we can, we will lose. My apologies once again, Your Highness, said Parvateshwar. I have never said that we should not fight back. I am eager to attack. I have been asking repeatedly for permission to declare war on the Chandravanshis. But if we fight without our rules, our codes, our ethics, then our way of life is as good as destroyed. And the Chandravanshis would have won without even fighting us. At the ringing of the Prahar town bell, the conversation was halted as everyone said a quick prayer. Shiva turned towards the window, wondering if Sati would be dancing today. Daksha turned to Shiva expectantly. Do you need to leave, my lord? No, your highness, said Shiva, hiding the pain and confusion he felt inside. I don't believe I am expected anywhere at this point in time. At this, the smile on Daksha's face disappeared with his hopes. Shiva continued. If it's all right with you, your highness, may we continue our conversation? Perhaps we can have our lunch a little later. Of course we may, my lord, smiled Daksha, pulling himself together. I've got the story so far, your highness. While I can understand your reasons for not wanting to attack right now, you clearly have a plan in which my blue throat has some strange role to play. Yes, we do have a plan, my lord. I feel that as an emperor, my giving in unthinkingly to the righteous anger of some of our people will not solve our problem. I believe that the people of Swadweep themselves are not evil. It is their Chandravanshi rulers and their way of life that has made them evil. The only way forward for us is to save the Swadweepans themselves. Save the Swadweepans? asked Shiva, genuinely surprised. Yes, my lord. Save them from the evil philosophy that infects their soul. Save them from their treacherous rulers. Save them from their sorry, meaningless existence. And we can do this by giving them the benefits of the superior Surya Vanshi way of life. Once they become like us, there'll be no reason to fight. We will live like brothers. This is the unfinished task of my father, King Brahmanayak. In fact, it is the unfinished task of Lord Ram. That is a big task to take on, Your Highness, said Shiva. It is sweeping in its kindness and reason, but it is a very big task. You will need soldiers to defeat their army and missionaries to bring them to your side. It's not going to be easy. I agree. 
There are many in my empire who have concerns about even attacking Swadweep, and I am putting forth a much bigger challenge to them of reforming Swadweep. That is why I did not want to launch this without the Nilkant, my lord. Shiva remembered his uncle's words, spoken many years back in what was almost another life. Your destiny lies beyond the mountains. Whether you fulfill it or run away once again is up to you. As Daksha spoke once again, Shiva refocused his attention on him. The problems that we are facing were prophesied, my lord, continued Daksha. Lord Ram had himself said that any philosophy, no matter how perfect, works only for a finite period. That is the law of nature and cannot be avoided. But what the legends also tell us is that when the problems become unsurmountable for ordinary men, the Nilkant will appear, and that he will destroy the evil Chandravanshis and restore the forces of good. My lord, you are the Nilkant. You can save us. You can complete the unfinished task of Lord Ram. You must lead us and help us defeat the Chandravanshis. You must rally the Swadweepans around to the side of good. Otherwise I fear that this beautiful country that we have, the near-perfect society of Meluha, will be destroyed in years of endless war. Will you help us, my lord? Will you lead us? Shiva was confused. But I didn't understand, your highness. What exactly would I do? I don't know, my lord. We only know our destination and that you will be our leader. The path we take is up to you. Bloody hell! They want me to destroy the entire way of life of 80 million people by myself. Are they mad? Shiva spoke carefully. I empathize with your people and their hardships, your highness. But to be quite honest, I don't really understand how one man like me can make a difference. If that man is you, my lord, said Daksha, his moist eyes open wide in devotion and faith, he can change the entire universe. I'm not so sure of that, your highness, said Shiva with a weak smile. Why will my being present make such a difference? I'm no miracle worker. I cannot snap my fingers and cause bolts of lightning to descend on the Chandravanshis. It is your presence itself that will make the difference, my lord. I invite you to travel through the empire. See the effect your blue throat has on the people. Once my people believe that they can do it, they will be able to do it. You are the Nilkant, my lord, added Kanakla. The people have faith in the bearer of the blue throat. They will have faith in you. Will you help us, my lord? Will you run away once again? But how do you know that my blue throat makes me the genuine Nilkant? asked Shiva. For all you know, there may be many Meluhans with a blue throat waiting to be discovered. No, my lord, said Daksha. It cannot be a Meluhan. The legend says that the Nilkant will be a foreigner. He cannot be from the Sapt Sindhu. And that he will get a blue throat on drinking the Somras. Shiva did not answer. He looked stunned as truth suddenly dawned upon him. Srinagar, the first night, Somras. That's how my body got repaired. That's why I'm feeling stronger than ever. Daksha and Ganakhla looked at Shiva breathlessly, waiting for his decision, praying for his right decision. But why only me? All the gunas were given the Somras. Was my uncle right? Do I really have a destiny? Parvateshwar stared at Shiva with narrowed eyes. I don't deserve any destiny. But maybe this is my chance to redeem myself. But first, Shiva asked with controlled politeness. Your Highness, before I answer, may I ask you a question? Of course, my lord. Do you agree that honesty is required to make any friendship work, even if it means deeply offending your friend with the truth? Yes, of course, replied Daksha, wondering where Shiva was going with this. Complete honesty is not just the bedrock of an individual relationship, but of any stable society, interjected Parvateshwar. I couldn't agree more, said Shiva, and yet Maluha wasn't honest with me. Nobody said anything. Shiva continued in a courteous but firm tone. When my tribe was being invited to come to Meluha, we had the impression you wanted immigrants because you needed people to work, and I was happy to escape my benighted land. But now I realize that you were systematically searching for the Nilkant. Turning to Nandi, Shiva said, We weren't told that a medicine called the Somras would be administered to us as soon as we entered. We weren't told that the medicine would have such effects. 
Nandi looked down with guilty eyes. His lord had the right to be angry with him. Turning to Daksha, Shiva continued, Your Highness, you know that the Somras was probably administered to me on my first night in Kashmir without my knowledge. I am truly sorry about that dishonesty, my lord, said Daksha with his hands in a penitent namaste. It's something that I will always be ashamed of. But the stakes were too high for us. And the Somras has considerably positive effects on your body. It doesn't harm you in any way. I know. I'm not exactly upset about having to live a long and healthy life, said Shiva wryly. Do you know that my tribe was also probably given the Somras that night? And they fell seriously ill, perhaps because of the Somras. They were under no risk, my lord, said Kanakla apologetically. Some people are predisposed towards certain diseases. When the Somras enters the body, it triggers the immediate occurrence of these diseases, which, when cured, never recur. Hence, the body remains healthy till death. Your tribe is actually much healthier now. No doubt they are, said Shiva. The point is not about the effects of the Somras. Both my tribe and I are better for it. Yet, from what I understand of Meluha, getting somebody to do something without telling him all the facts would not have been Lord Ram's way. You should have told us the complete truth at Mount Kailash. Then, you should have let us make an informed choice rather than you making a choice for us. We probably would still have come to Meluha anyway, but then it would have been our choice. Please forgive us the deception, my lord, said Daksha with guilty regret. It is not our way to do something like this. We pride ourselves on our honesty, but we had no choice. We are truly sorry, my lord. Your people are well taken care of. They are healthier than ever. They will live long, productive lives. Parvateshwar finally broke his silence, speaking what was always in his heart since the search had begun many decades ago. Shiva, we are truly sorry for what has been done. You have every right to be angry. Lying is not our way. I think what was done is appalling and Lord Ram would never have condoned this. No matter how serious our troubles, we have no right to deceive someone into helping us. I am deeply sorry. Shiva raised his eyebrow a bit. Parvateshwar is the only one apologizing instead of making excuses. He is a true follower of the great King Ram's way. Shiva smiled. Daksha let out an audible sigh of relief. Shiva turned towards Daksha. Let us put this thing in the past, Your Highness. Like I said, there are some things about your nation that could be improved. No doubt about that. But it is amongst the best societies that I have ever seen. And it is worth fighting for. But I have a few conditions. Of course, my lord, said Daksha, eager to please. At this point in time, I am not saying that I can perform the tasks that you expect of me, nor am I saying that I cannot do it. All I am saying is that I will try my best. But before that, I want to understand more of your society before I can be sure of how I can help. I am assuming that nothing will be hidden from me, nor will I be misled. Of course, my lord. Secondly, you still need immigrants to expand your population, but you should not mislead them. I think that you should tell them the entire truth about Meluha and let them make an informed decision on whether to come here, or you don't invite them at all. Is that fair? Of course it is, my lord, said Daksha. Nodding briefly towards Kanakla, he committed, We will implement that immediately. Furthermore, it is clear to me that I am not going back to Kashmir. Can my tribe, the Gunas, be brought to Devagiri? I would like them to be with me. Of course, my lord, said Daksha with a quick look at Kanakla. Instructions will be sent today itself to bring them to Devagiri. Also, I would like to visit the location where you manufacture the Sombras. I would like to understand this drink of the gods. Something tells me that it is important to do so. Of course you may, my lord, said Daksha, his face finally breaking into a nervous smile. Kanakla will take you there tomorrow itself. In fact, my family is also scheduled for a visit there day after tomorrow for a puja at the Brahma temple. But perhaps we could meet there. That would be nice, said Shiva, smiling. Then, taking a deep breath, he added, And lastly, I guess that you would like to announce the arrival of the Nilkant to your people. Daksha and Kanakla nodded hesitantly. I would like to request that you don't do that for now. Daksha and Kanakla's face fell immediately. Nandi's eyes were glued to the floor. He had stopped listening to the conversation. The enormity of his prevarication was tearing him apart. Your Highness, I have a terrible feeling that when people know I am the Nilkant, 
Every action and word of mine will be over-interpreted and over-analyzed, explained Shiva. I am afraid that I don't know enough about your society or my task to be able to handle that at this point in time. I understand, my lord, said Daksha, pulling a broken smile back on his face. You have my word. Only my immediate staff, my family and the people you allow will know of the Nilkant's arrival, nobody else. Thank you, your highness. But I will say it again. I am a simple tribal man who just happened to get a blue throat because of some exotic medicine. Honestly, I still don't know what one man like me can do in the face of the odds that you face. And I'll say it again, my lord, said Daksha with a childlike smile. If that man is you, he can change the entire universe. Chapter 8 Drink of the Gods Shiva and Nandi were walking back to the royal guest house. Shiva had decided he wanted to eat lunch alone. Nandi walked a few steps behind, his head bowed in self-recrimination. My lord, I am so sorry. Shiva turned around to gaze at Nandi. You are right, my lord. We were so lost in our own troubles and the search for the Nilkant that we didn't realize the unfairness of our actions on immigrants. I misled you, my lord. I lied to you. Shiva didn't say anything. He continued to stare intensely into Nandi's eyes. I am so sorry, my lord. I have failed you. I will accept whatever punishment you give me. Shiva's lips broke into a very faint smile. He patted Nandi lightly on his shoulders, signaling he had forgiven him. But his eyes delivered a clear message. Never lie to me again, my friend. Nandi nodded and whispered, Never, my lord. I am so sorry. Forget it, Nandi, said Shiva, his smile a little broader now. It's in the past. They turned and continued walking. Suddenly, Shiva shook his head and chuckled slightly. Strange people. What is it, my lord? asked Nandi. Nothing really. I was just wondering at some of the interesting things about your society. Interesting, my lord? asked Nandi, feeling a little more confident now that Shiva was speaking to him again. Well, some people in your country think just the presence of my blue throat can help you achieve impossible tasks. Some people actually think that my name has suddenly become so holy that they can't even speak it. Nandi smiled slightly. On the other hand, continued Shiva, some people clearly think that I am not required. In fact, they even think that my touching them is so polluting that I need to get a Shuddhikaran done. A Shuddhikaran? Why would you need that, my lord? asked Nandi, a little concerned. Shiva weighed his words carefully. Well, I touched someone, and I was told that I would need to undergo a Shuddhikaran. What? Who did you touch, my lord? Was it a Vikarma person? asked a troubled Nandi. Only the touch of a Vikarma person would mean that you would need to get a Shuddhikaran. Shiva's face abruptly changed color. A veil lifted from his eyes. He suddenly understood the significance of the events of the previous day, her hasty withdrawal at being touched, the shocked reactions from the Guruji and Kritika. Go back to the guest house, Nandi. I'll see you there, said Shiva, as he turned towards the guest house garden. My lord, what happened? asked Nandi, trying to keep pace with Shiva. Did you get the Shuddhikaran done or not? Go to the guest house, Nandi, said Shiva, walking rapidly away. I will see you there. Shiva waited for the larger part of an hour, but it was in vain, for Sati did not make an appearance. He sat on the bench by himself, cursing the moment when that terrible thought had entered his mind. How could I have even thought that Sati would find my touch polluting? I am such a bloody idiot! He replayed moments of that fateful encounter in his mind and analyzed every facet of it. If something happened to you, I would never be able to forgive myself. What did she mean by saying that? Does she have feelings for me? Or is she just an honourable woman who can't bear to be the cause of someone else's misfortune? And why should she think of herself as inferior? This entire concept of the Vikarma is so damn ridiculous. Realising that she wasn't going to come, Shiva got up. He kicked the bench hard, getting a painful reminder that his once numb toe had got its sensation back. Cursing out loud, he started walking back to the guest house. Walking past the stage, he noticed that there was something lying on the dance floor. He went closer and bent down to pick it up. It was her bead bracelet. He had seen it on her right hand. The string did not seem broken. Had she purposely dropped it here? He smelt it. It had the fragrance of the holy lake on a sun-kissed evening. He brought it delicately to his lips and kissed it gently. Smiling, he dropped the bracelet into the pouch tied around his waist. He would come back from Mount Mandar and meet her. He had to meet her. 
He would pursue her to the end of the world if required. He would fight the entire human race to have her. His journey in this life was incomplete without her. His heart knew it. His soul knew it. How much further is it, Madam Prime Minister? asked Nandi, behaving like an excited child. A visit to the mythical Mount Mandar, the hub where the drink of the gods was manufactured, was a rare honour for any Meluhan. For most Suryavanshis, Mount Mandar was the soul of their empire. For as long as it was safe, so was the Somras. It's only been an hour since we left Devagiri, Captain, said Kanakla, smiling. It's a day's journey to Mount Mandar. Actually, because of the blinds on the carriage windows, I can't see anything outside, and I can't tell how much time has gone by since I can't see the sun either. That's why I was asking. The Prahar lamp is right behind you, Captain. The blinds are down for your protection. Shiva smiled at Kanakla. He could understand that the blinds were not for their protection, but for the safety of Mount Mandar, to keep its location secret. Very few people knew of its exact location. There was an elite team of soldiers called the Arish Tanemi who protected the road to Mount Mandar and the travellers on it. Except for the scientists of Mount Mandar, the Arish Tanemi and any person authorised by the Emperor, nobody was allowed to the mountain or to know its location. If the Chandravanshi terrorists attacked Mount Mandar, all would be lost for Meluha. Who would we be meeting there, Kanakla? asked Shiva. My lord, we would be meeting Brahaspati. He is the chief scientist of the empire. He leads the team of scientists who manufacture the Somras for the entire country. Of course, they also conduct research in many other fields. A bird courier has already been sent to him, informing him of your arrival. We will be meeting him tomorrow morning. Shiva nodded slightly, smiled at Kanakla and said, Thank you. As Nandi looked at the Prahad lamp again, Shiva went back to his book. It was an interesting manuscript about the terrible war that was fought many thousands of years ago between the Devas, the gods, and the Asuras, the demons, an eternal struggle between opposites, good and evil. The Devas, with the help of Lord Rudra, the Mahadev, the god of gods, had destroyed the Asuras and established righteousness in the world again. I hope you slept well, my lord, said Kanakla, as she welcomed Shiva and Nandi into the chamber outside Brahaspati's office. It was the beginning of the last hour of the first Prahar. Days began early at Mount Mandar. Yes, I did, said Shiva, though there was a strange rhythmic sound on through the night. Kanakla smiled, but did not offer any explanation. She bowed her head and opened the door to let Shiva into Brahaspati's office. Shiva walked in, followed by Kanakla and Nandi. There were various strange instruments spread throughout Brahaspati's large office, neatly organized on tables of different heights. There were palm leaf notes alongside each of the instruments where some experiments had clearly been conducted. The room was a restrained blue. There was a large picture window in the corner which afforded a breathtaking view of the dense forest at the foot of the mountain. At the centre, many simple low seats had been arranged together in a square. It was a frugal room, in line with a culture that celebrated simplicity over style at every turn. Brahaspati was standing in the centre of the room, his hands folded in a namaste. Of medium height, much shorter than Shiva, his wheat-coloured skin, deep-set eyes and well-manicured beard gave Brahaspati a distinguished appearance. A clean-shaven head except for the choti and a serene expression gave his face an intellectual look. His body was slightly overweight. His broad shoulders and barrel chest would have been markedly pronounced if they had been exercised a bit. But Brahaspati's body was a vehicle for his intellect and not the temple that it is to a warrior or kshatriya. Brahaspati wore a typical white cotton dhoti and an angvastram draped loosely over his shoulders. He wore a janeyu tied from his left shoulder down to the right side of his hips. How are you, Kanakla? asked Brahaspati. It has been a long time. Yes, it has, Brahaspati, said Kanakla, greeting Brahaspati with a namaste and a low bow. Shiva noticed that the second amulet on Brahaspati's arm showed him as a swan, a very select chosen tribe among Brahmins. This is Lord Shiva, said Kanakla, pointing towards Shiva. Just Shiva will do, thank you, smiled Shiva, with a polite namaste towards Brahaspati. All right then, just Shiva it is. And who might you be? asked Brahaspati, turning towards Nandi. This is Captain Nandi, answered Kanakla, Lord Shiva's aide. A pleasure to meet you, Captain, said Brahaspati, before turning back to Shiva. I don't mean to sound rude, Shiva, but would it be possible for me to see your throat? Shiva nodded. 
As he took off his cravat, Rasputi came forward to examine the throat. His smile disappeared as he saw Shiva's throat radiating a bright blue hue. Rasputi was speechless for a few moments. Slowly gathering his wits, he turned towards Kanakla. This is not a fraud. The color comes from the inside. How is this possible? This means that... Yes, said Kanakla softly, with a happiness that seemed to emanate from deep inside. It means the Nilkant has come. Our saviour has come. Well, I don't know if I'm a saviour or anything like that, said an embarrassed Shiva, retying the cravat around his throat. But I will certainly try my best to help your wonderful country. It is for this reason that I come to you. Something tells me that it is important for me to know how the Somras works. Braspati still seemed to be in a daze. He continued to watch Shiva, but his attention seemed elsewhere. He appeared to be working out the implications of the true Nilkant's arrival. Braspati, said Kanakla, as she tried to call the chief scientist.